Hi everyone, and welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. It's been uh, just over a couple weeks since I put up an interview, so I'm uh, really excited to have another one ready to go. Uh, I did this interview just earlier today with Marcus Sawyer. Uh, he was a guy who got into Scientology in Louisiana, and then not too long after that, made his way over to Los Angeles uh, and started working at the Melrose Mission, which at that time was a, a brand new mission. In fact, when he moved out to Los Angeles, it was to help get that mission uh, renovated and open. So he actually uh, helped start the thing. And uh, Marcus and I did not know each other when we were in Scientology. We did not know each other in Los Angeles, even though we were working with a lot of the same people. And so I was really fascinated to hear, um, hear his story. And I think you will find it pretty fascinating as well. Some pretty incredible stuff in here. And I know it's a long one, but if you listen to the whole two and a half hours, I think you will not regret it. And uh, well, I'll let the rest speak for itself. I hope you enjoy it. We have another interview today. Uh, everybody say hello to Marcus Sawyer. Hello, Marcus Sawyer. Zeno, Zeno, my customary greeting. <laughs> so Marcus, you're, you have a YouTube channel where you put up a, a whole bunch of videos. I ran into your YouTube channel a little while back and um, yeah, you've got 50 videos up on there now. Some really good stuff too. Um, and the name of Marcus's YouTube channel for everybody is Wog World, W-O-G-W-O-R-L-D. The WOG world is what Scientologists call the entire world that exists outside of Scientology. Non-Scientologists are WOGs. The, uh, the world at large is the WOG world. So what made you start your YouTube channel, Marcus? Uh, well, around 2013, I started uh, looking up the materials that you're not supposed to look up, you know, the OT3 materials. Um, primarily, I wanted to know I wanted to know what the materials of OT3 were because I'd heard so much stuff. And, and I'd also gotten people on the bridge, gotten people into Scientology. There were some staff members and ex-public uh, uh, that I'd contacted and apologized for some of the stuff I'd done. So I was actually doing a doubt condition as to whether or not I should be in Scientology anymore because I was an indie for uh, seven years after I left. And what prompted me to start the channel was the doubt condition and uh, working up through the conditions. And uh, I, I honestly can't remember if it's the liability or the doubt condition where you deliver an effective blow to the um, organization you were pretending to be a part of despite personal danger. So the first video I did was after, uh, I think it was after 10 years or after however many years, uh, I'm finally out of Scientology. And it's a long video, it's two hours long. And I basically described everything from when I got in to how I ended up leaving. Interesting. Um, so let's take a step back for the viewers here. Uh, when, did, when did you get into Scientology? How did you get into Scientology? Uh, I got in, in around, when I was around, this was a very hazy time for me because I was just coming off of a really long stint of um, touring. Uh, I was a musician, touring musician from 1998 to 2001-ish. And I was, I was doing a lot of drugs. So that was a big uh, part of how I got into Scientology. I had gotten a hold of some kind of, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, sprayed on to some some pot or or if I was literally now that I'm studying psychology I'm wondering if I was having a, a sort of a schizoaffective disorder where I was hallucinating uh, non-stop I was literally hallucinating and it felt like I had I was on acid I had done acid before so I knew what it was like it felt like I was on acid all the time and I couldn't stop it I had to take uh, Dephenhydramine, which is uh, uh, what you take for like sinus problems and stuff, it uh, clears up your sinuses and, and it's also uh, uh, helps you sleep. So I would have to take that to sleep because the hallucinations were so bad. <clears throat> and uh, back then the internet wasn't what it is now. There was very little information. You still go to bookstores and libraries and um, I had found this guy in the UK who wrote a book called The Happiness Purpose named Edward de Bono. And this guy had a similar experience to me. 
Uh, he took some, but he had taken mushrooms. So he was hallucinating for two years and uh, came out of it through the help of his family and his girlfriend. And I was searching for his book. Uh, but I ended up going to Walden Books. Um, and my cousin worked there and, and she brought me to the help, self-help section. And I was looking for this book. I was really focused on finding this book called The Happiness Purpose. But uh, she was like, well, there, we don't have that. but..." Uh, there's this book and it was a Dianetics book. I imagine there was like old stock that needed to get, needed to get read up because I remember my copy after having been on staff, uh, now that I look back on it, like that copy was a really old copy of Dianetics from the eighties, probably <laughs> just, you know, overprinted. So I bought that book and I read book one in one sitting and you it really did. I really did. There's so many people who say that, and I, I always go, no one reads book one in one sitting. That's just an exaggeration. How, how did you do that? Because when you are hallucinating constantly, when you are, when that's like all that your life is, like, okay, when I, when, I'll give you some examples. Like when people would talk to me, their, their words physically had an effect on me. So sometimes when people would talk to me, specific people like my dad or my mom, uh, I felt like they were punching me in the face and I had the physical somatic of that. Um, when I would look at the ceiling or look around, there was always things moving. I had peripheral hallucinations that kept me from driving a lot because when I would drive around here in the South, there's a lot of trees everywhere. And these trees in my peripheral vision would come down. like like they were obscuring my vision like at a certain point when i'd be driving like all i could see was this hole in front of me and the rest was just trees just trees from from miles back still in my peripheral vision so it was almost like i was the way i describe it is i was seeing at like 12 to 15 frames a second so the, the way that i was able to read book one in one sitting was just out of pure terror you know it's like i gotta figure out something and this guy uh, seems to have some sort of inside knowledge about the mind and how it works, really. I didn't want to go back to rehab. I'd already been through that route. And I didn't want to take drugs because any drug that I, I mean, I had been doing a ton of drugs. And uh, I've already, you know, that the doctor, I went and saw a doctor, like, we could put you on some benzos and chill you out. And I was like, man, that's probably the last thing I need because then the benzos will make me more paranoid because I'm taking drugs. I don't want to do drugs anymore. Um, so I read all the way to the end of book one and in the middle, right where book one goes to book two, there was a flyer uh, or a little pullout. And it said clear body, clear mind. And it said call 24 hours a day. So I, uh, I called the number, it was like three in the morning and I, it was probably some SO terminal um, that uh, routed me to Baton Rouge and gave uh, the PES over there, uh, you know, a lead. And uh, I called the next day and got started getting set up to do my purification rundown over there. Nice. So uh, remind me again, <clears throat> what year, uh, around what year was this? This would have been around 2001, yeah. And how old would you would you have been at that time? Oh man, I suck at math. 20, well, how old are you now? I'm 37. 37. 37. Okay, so yeah. you're around 2021, 20, depending. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I'm gonna do my best as we uh, have this talk to uh, define some terms for the non Scientology viewing public. Um, yeah. Before you mentioned the doing doubt or liability. Uh, so in Scientology, there's something called the ethics conditions, and that's something I've been meaning to do a video on, but it's a lot to bite off. Um, but let's say the doubt formula, each condition has a formula and a, a, a set of steps that you're supposed to read the step and do the step. And sometimes the step is kind of a mental exercise of thinking about something or resolving your thoughts about something. Sometimes the step is things you actually have to do. So the doubt condition is what you're, the, the, the condition you're supposed to apply when you're unsure whether to leave a group or stay with a group. 
And as a part of that formula, you're supposed to look at the statistics and activities and intentions of each one of the groups. And then you're supposed to decide which group to join, which one's going to be kind of better for the universe, <laughs> all told, which group if you were to join it. And then you're supposed to do everything to support the new group and if necessary, everything to hurt the old group, not depending. So that's something you mentioned previously. Uh, when you say an SO terminal, that just means a Sea Org member. Um, when you said they body routed you to the local um, mission, uh, that just means they sent you there or referred you there. And then when you said the PES, that is just the person over, uh, that's public executive secretary uh, there over the divisions that are responsible for bringing in new people into Scientology and doing their first services. Um, okay, so you got in through the purification rundown route. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's about 16, 17 years ago, depending. Um, and then, so what was your experience in the purification rundown? What happened? Well, um, when I went and did my original uh, registration cycle, uh, where I signed up for the purification rundown, um, of course, you sign a bunch of paperwork saying, you know, you don't know what the hell it says. It's just a whole bunch of shit, you know. Was, uh, I, I, by the way, I, I don't mean to, uh, I just said, I just dropped an S-bomb. I don't know if uh, language oh, no, is an we, issue we on Oh, no, we are um, advocates of swearing on this channel. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, let me jump in with a real quick question that I forgot to ask. Sure. At this point, so you pick up Dianetics, mm -hmm. which the Church of Scientology would like you to believe, you, the public at large, that Dianetics and Scientology are two completely different subjects. Dianetics is a science. Scientology is a philosophy or religion, depending on what decade you got involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, at the point where you are sent to do the mission, I'm sorry, to do the PRF at the mission, mm -hmm. do you become aware that you're now walking into Scientology or are you still thinking, I want that Dianetics stuff? Dude, that's a really, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, it was uh, quite some time before I even realized that the two were even connected. Uh, I thought I was going to a Dianetic Center. I didn't know, I mean, I didn't, I hadn't heard about Scientology really that much uh, other than just slight passings in the news or whatever, you know, with John Travolta being a Scientologist and uh, Tom Cruise having done some Scientology. Um, and perhaps Christy Alley too, but uh, I, I, uh, that was not mentioned in the registration cycle. Um, however, I did see that uh, the logo for the, the Scientology logo with the two triangles and the S, and uh, that my state of mind at that time, like I said, I was hallucinating constantly, and there were some very schizoaffective type things going on. So, uh, I had always had this obsession with triangles because they are the perfect structure. They support, you know, each side supports perfectly. And my last name is Sawyer. So there was two triangles and an S and I just thought, well, whatever, that means I'm supposed to be here. So I took it as a sign <laughs> or an omen, like straight up. I took it as a sign or omen, I was signing my shit away. Um, but no, I did not know that it was uh, related to Scientology. Uh, I thought it was a Dianetic thing. and um uh natasha explained to me that you know she had seen cases like this before uh and indeed later on i met a guy in ventura who had a similar issue that he did the purification rundown for and um uh so she she wasn't she wasn't she wasn't lying she had uh connections with the ventura mission and she she had seen someone with the types of hallucinations that i was having go through the purif and go through it successfully and reduce and or eliminate the hallucinations that they were having. Right. Now, doesn't the mission, I might have this wrong, but doesn't every mission, wouldn't the sign outside say Church of Scientology, Mission of Baton Rouge? Not at that time. At that time, it just said Dianetics, Baton Rouge. Not, not <laughs> all, Scientology? Nope. No, not, not on the sign. Interesting. You know, when, um, Baton Rouge, I'm trying to remember if that's one of the missions that was, was it really nice, a really nice building? Uh, most of the properties that the Steiners had were very nice, yes. And they were in oh, very... It was one of the Steiner missions. Yes. I know those guys. So um, they might have had it set up the, the true proper way, mm -hmm. which is there's supposed to be a separate entrance 
for people that are getting involved with Dianetics and people that are getting involved with Scientology. Front and back. Front and back. The front so was saying, the Dianetics and the back was That's Scientology. right. The one entrance is supposed to say like the Dianetics Foundation and the other entrance will say, you know, Church of Scientology, Mission of Baton Rouge. So, but Scientology considers Dianetics, well, first of all, once you're familiar with the whole bridge to total freedom, Dianetics applies all the way up through the top of the OT levels. Sure. But Scientology considers the book Dianetics to be an introductory route into Scientology. So it's kind of disingenuous to even pretend at any point that they're separate. They're not separate. Right. They're just trying not to get the bad press of Scientology. Um, they're not trying to sully the good, good name. <laughs> the dignified name of Dianetics. Right. All of the bad press of Scientology. Well, they did a great um, job. I mean, uh, from the outside, you know, most of the people, because the South is really uh, religious, you know, Bible Belt type uh, area, and any kind of new uh, culty type religion, there's, there's going to be some some blowback from the local community. But there was there was never really any at the Baton Rouge uh, mission. There was just the Dianetics Center. And that's that's really interesting. Said. That's really interesting. All right, so let's get back to before I interrupted you. Um, so what was the pure like? What happened? How'd that go? Well, uh, when I got started, uh, they explained to me, uh, and they have a doctor on staff, um, and uh, he examined me to make sure that everything was okay. They did want to do some qual, which, you know, qualifying steps to make sure that there wasn't anything like uh, neurologically wrong with me because I was reporting of hallucinations and stuff. So the uh, on staff doctor, uh, had me go do a CAT scan, and at the time, I mean, we did, at that time, this was early 2000s. The technology wasn't quite what it is now. They didn't. Have, there were certain scans that that we have now that they didn't have then. But I did go through the whole rigmarole of, uh, which is not a Scientology term. That's like an old thing that we say around they here. They sent you to like a hospital to do this, right? I mean, they're not giving yeah. you that. The mission. Right, right. I went to, uh, I actually had to leave the mission, come back home to Lake Charles and get all of this done at uh, uh, Lake Charles Memorial Hospital. And then the results were then sent to the staff doctor, uh, who was an ER doctor in Baton Rouge. And he checked me out and said, everything's good. Um, and uh, then I uh, started the Purif, which was an intense regimen of uh, vitamins and, and uh, sweating in a sauna and, and some light exercise uh, for four to five hours a day. I'd be in the sauna. And uh, during that time, I was staying at an Econo Lodge about a mile and a half down the road from the mission. Um, the first couple of days were pretty grueling, and I really hated taking the oil and, and uh, uh, the, I guess, the uh, Silver lining to that was the lecithin. I'd never had lecithin before. And lecithin I thought, is nasty. I thought it tasted awesome. I was like, man, <laughs> this stuff's good because I'd drink the oil and be like, oh. And then they give me the little cup of lecithin, the South African guy, and he had that such, such a funny accent to me. Um, he's from Pretoria. And um, he gave me the uh, lecithin. And I, you know, that was, that was the end of my day when I took all my vitamins and stuff um, and the oil. Um, I would go back to, um, I would go back to the Econo Lodge and I, I didn't do any courses. I didn't do anything other than show up to the mission, do my Purif and then leave. Right. Were you the only one on the Purif at the time? Uh, when I started, yes, there was an, uh, old guy that named Jim, uh, from New Orleans, uh, who started the Purif not long after I did, and he uh, he claimed to have been, uh, he claimed to have worked with Hubbard uh, at St. Hill and was a, uh, there's an old post title, I can't remember the name of it, it starts with a W, um, but uh, he was, he started, he started the Purif, and uh, he was a really interesting guy to talk to, plus I was in the sauna alone, so it was like, you know, it was nice to have anybody to talk to in there for four or five hours. Yeah. In my experience, uh, any church of Scientology has an average of zero to one people <laughs> on the Pure at any given time. So how long were you on the Pure? It's all in all in total about seven months. Seven months? Yeah. On the purification rundown, looking back on it at that time, would you say it was 
a positive or negative experience for you? Uh, overall, a positive experience. The uh, hallucinations actually did start to diminish in, in uh, frequency and duration. Interesting. And so then, so what was your next step in the world of Scientology after that? Well, there, there was, uh, that was my first step into the world of Scientology. Um, uh, about a month after I started the Purif, um, my brother uh, contacted me and he was interested in doing uh, the Purif because I told him that I was there doing that and, and he was he was interested in it because he had been doing a lot of drugs himself. So um, he came down and checked it out. And uh, of course, you know how staff is. They're like, oh yeah, let's bring somebody in. You need a twin anyway. So uh, uh, we we twinned up and um, and and that's, he, he actually started in Scientology before I did. Uh, they got him doing uh, ups and downs course, which is a beginner course. Uh, that you, uh, that they'll start you out on in Scientology, and uh, I I didn't do any courses uh, for quite a while. I was focusing on getting my hallucinations under control, um, and they sort of you know got it to got got me and my brother to work together, and got my brother to sort of uh, get me interested in um, doing some some courses where we could twin comp communication drills and the, and uh, the, the case supervisor said that I could benefit from doing uh, therapeutic uh, TRs, uh, training routines. Can I jump in with a question real quick here? Yeah. Are you still referring to the seven month period that you were on the PRF where like, so you're on the PRF, your brother starts doing some coursework, but because you're only on the PRF doesn't take all day. Are you saying they wanted you to be doing some coursework simultaneously doing a purif or are you talking about the period after you purif yeah during the uh i'd say probably halfway roughly halfway through my purif uh they got me and my brother to start doing stuff you know because like you said you're not you're not doing that all day and the case supervisor uh recommended that i do some therapeutic trs and that was how they got me into the course room i got it I and just for the people just there. for the viewers like uh, the, the viewers probably already have a pretty good, um, have heard this term, the training routines, the communication drills that Scientology kind of becomes famous for because of the one where you sit and kind of stare at someone for a couple hours. That's why Scientologists don't blink very much because they get used to just staring at people. Um, there's various versions and, and um, gradients of the TRS course and the therapeutic TRS course is just the lowest simplest, easiest gradient that is intended to be more therapeutic than anything else. Well, that's why it's called therapeutic. It's like, um, and I think it is most often done with people that are coming off of um, uh, drug habits or whatever, to just get them used to even the concept of um, being anywhere comfortably and communicating to anybody. I just wanted to clear that up. I keep interrupting you. I'm going to try not to do that. No, that's fine. That's, it's all good, man. Um, so the, uh, to me, when I started doing the, the, the TRs uh, in, in conjunction with the purification rundown, um, I was having a lot of really bad experiences because when you do the TR where your, your eyes are open, uh, the hallucinations were getting worse. So I would tell the course supervisor, uh, and I, I was like, dude, I can't handle this. You know, like I can't, I can't sit here all day and and trip, you know, because <laughs> my brother's face is going like, and uh, and I'm hearing noises and the the walls are coming in and 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 he's like, it's okay, you're just running it out. You just gotta stay the course and keep doing it, you know, whatever. And I'm like, hmm, okay. dude, I really think this is why they kept you in the pure for seven months. They can't let you attest to completing the pure if you're hallucinating. Right. And, it, and you said you didn't even start the coursework until you're like halfway through the pure. So you're doing the damn pure for three months and you're still hallucinating like this. No wonder oh, they kept yeah. you on it for so long. There was a there was a, uh, an incident that uh, <clears throat> the entire mission, this is a pretty big building. Um, 
I was in the, I was in the room by my in the, in the sauna by myself, Travis had already, my brother had already completed the Pura. He completed the Pura like in a month. Okay. Like he was like, I'm good. <laughs> and I'm still in there. Uh, and I've seen people come and go, you know, like people start their Pura, leave their Pura, start their Pura. And I'm still there. And I'm just like, Jesus, I had a, a total psychotic break once in the, in the sauna. And I was punching walls and I was screaming and I was kicking and I was just like, I would hurl my body up against the wall and scream and, and scream people's names, like the, uh, the, the auditor's names, the course supervisor's names, everybody. And people in the course room, which I want to say was like uh, two or 300 feet away through walls could hear me screaming. And it was like reported, like there were KRs written and stuff. And I had to do a specific handling on the meter because it's like, hey, this is not OK. You know, like we understand that you're going through some shit. Um, and, and but but the funny thing was the the, uh, the purification in charge, uh, he just sat there reading his magazine. He's like totally ignoring <laughs> you. You're going ape shit in the sauna. No, he got his TRs in. You know, he's like, he's got his TR totally in. <laughs> And he's like, you might want to take some salt and potassium. <laughs> Would you like some more potassium? I think you're low on potassium. Would you like some oil? <laughs> more salt tablets. Here's some more salt tablets. <clears throat> and I'm just going nuts, man. So, um, yeah, that, after that, uh, there, was a break, there was a breakthrough for me after that. Like, I... Uh, I, uh, I got that all out of my system. I just, I, I, I don't know why. I just had to go completely psycho, man, because I felt, I kind of felt like they weren't uh, paying attention to, to the symptoms that I was having. And, and the TRs were really driving me nuts because sitting there for two, three hours staring at somebody when, when hallucination is my problem, the only thing I want to do is close my eyes and curl up in a ball in a fetal position and sleep. So, um, that was a funny little incident, but the first real introduction I had into Scientology would have been uh, the TRs and then uh, the ups and downs course. Right. So my brother recommended the, the ups and downs course. It's called the ups and downs in life. That is the um, the introductory course that starts to educate people um, on the subject of suppressive people, suppressive persons and potential trouble sources and the fact that any accidents or illnesses or depression, Scientology calls it roller coastering because it's an emotional roller coaster, um, is the cause of being connected to suppressive people. So you really start getting indoctrinated into that way of thinking very, very early on in Scientology. Um, so, okay, so you're doing the TRs, you're doing the ups and downs in life while you're on the Purif. So that's pretty much your intro to Scientology. Yep. And it's worth noting that before I did the ups and downs course, uh, I I, uh, I had no interest once they mentioned the word Scientology. Um, I was like, because I was not religious, I, I had no interest in religion. I'd been involved in, you know, Catholicism and baptism and all this other stuff. And I was like, you know what, you could take your religion and shove it up your ass because I don't. I'm not here for that. I'm here to get my mind in a place and stop the hallucinations. And and then there was one guy um, who uh, was the course supervisor. Um, when I started uh, the ups and downs and I read that it was Scientology and it's a religious organization, religion, I'm just like, the word religion just like struck a nerve on me. I'm just like, fuck this, you know? And um, and then he, he was like coming up to me is like with the, with the second phenomenon, you know, the, he's like, what, tapping on my shoulder um, and just clarify second phenomenon, misunderstood word, the misunderstood word. I was exhibiting phenomenon of the misunderstood word in this guy's mind. So like, he's like, is there a word you didn't fully or completely understand or have a full conceptual understanding of? And I'm like, no, motherfucker, I just don't like religion. And uh, he took me aside into the course suit's room office. And he was like, um, I understand you have a problem with religion and stuff, uh, but is there a misunderstood word? And he just kept going on this misunderstood word thing, you know, and I'm just like, dude, there's not a fucking word I misunderstand. You're misunderstanding me. I don't like religion. I don't like organized religion. I don't like Catholicism. I don't like any of it. 
And he was like, I got that. And it was, there was something that happened in that office, his ability to take whatever I said, and it was very hostile and it got very hostile towards the, the end where I was like, fuck you, I'm walking out of here. And he just got in front of the door and stood there like a, like a stone, like a stoic just stone. He was just standing there. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Or do you want to get hurt? You know? And uh, because I was very, very mad. And uh, the whole course room was there, there was a window where you could see. So like people knew there was like eight or nine people on course and they had heard this whole argument, you know? Um, and so I'm like, get out of my way. I'm about to leave and walk out of here and I'm not coming back. And this guy, I talk about him uh, a lot in my, uh, on my channel, because uh, he's still involved and I, I still care about him very much. Um, but uh, he was the guy that really changed my viewpoint and, and got me to uh, give it a chance because he stood in front of me and he said, look, you're here because of some really shitty situations, some of which you're responsible for and some of which I don't believe you're re completely responsible for. Um, and you can walk out of here. Basically, he gave me the spiel that you get at the... Uh, you know what I'm talking about. The, the orientation film. The orientation film. <clears throat> you could jump off a bridge or blow your brains out. It would be stupid, but you could do you it. You could do it. <laughs> That's pretty much what he said. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I could, I could do that. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, dude. I'll give it. I'll give it this one course. I'll give it a shot. And by the end of Ups and Downs, you do your first OW write-up. So um your overts and withholds and uh that was another thing that i felt a lot of relief from so that was another thing that i felt helped and was right. beneficial so uh you mind if i jump in with a question real quick please yeah um two things a question and an explanation um you mentioned getting very angry and hostile and threatening to leave and then he jumps in front of the door I want to ask this question because I strongly suspect that when he did that, um, would you say it was done in a way that felt confrontational and he was going to prevent you from leaving? Or did he manage to do it in a way that didn't seem confrontational at all? Oh, yeah. No, he even said, you know, I, um, he said, I'm not going to let you leave. You know, I'm not going to let you leave and miss this opportunity to save yourself. Oh, because damn. He went hardcore. It, I mean, let me tell you, dude, the Steiners ran fundamentalist Scientology missions. And when I watched your video, The Matrix, uh, Scientology and uh, Disconnection, that is, I understand why you said it was your favorite video that you made because it's it's so right on, man. Um, and the, the Steiners have been involved in Scientology since the 60s. Um, they were very expertly running these missions and they were fundamentalists. And uh, I've been to other missions run by other mission holders. And, I, and it looks like candy land to me as a staff member. You know, they're just like, oh, I'm going to go and take some time. I'm going to I'm going to go hang out with my boyfriend or I'm going to go do this or, you know, oh, cool. Just be back on post by this time. And I'm just like, what? Because the Steiners, it's like you are freaking all in, dude, all the time. 16 hours plus a day, seven days a week, you know, and that's how that's how this guy was trained and that's how he was trained to handle people. So he literally, yeah, he went hardcore. He was like, I'm not going to let you leave. I'm not going to let you uh, pass this door and I will physically handle you if, if you try. Uh, I want you to give this a chance, one chance. You know, he's like, I want you to give it one chance if you don't, you know, I'm going to try and stop you from leaving, but I want you, <laughs> I want you Damn, to give it dude. one chance. Uh, <clears throat> if you give it one chance, I'll let you walk out the door if you don't like it and you think it won't help. Yeah. And that's how I, you know, I, there was something about the way he did it that appealed to a sense of like logicalness. Like there was some logic to it for me. Like it was, right. I can't explain it. Well, I, let me, let me jump in a little bit here because 
I mean, any former Scientologist or Sierra members watching this video would probably go, I don't know what Aaron's acting so surprised about. That's just hard sell in Scientology. But the truth is, um, <clears throat> not everybody can pull that off. And the way Hubbard describes hard sell, all Scientology registrars are supposed to be hard sell. Um, and the way he couches this, um, uh, well, it's insisting that somebody buy something and not taking no for an answer. But the way he couches this in virtue or <laughs> couches it in a way that makes it virtuous is that it's, um, it's based in a care for the individual. That's you right. care so much about the person, you won't let them throw away their eternity by saying no because they don't know what they're saying no to. And that's when he says to you, um, I'm not going to let you leave. Mm -hmm. The way he can justify that to himself is because I care about you so much and I believe in this so much, I'm not going to let you throw away this opportunity. And if someone does it right and they believe it, um, man, they can sell you anything, especially Scientology. I mean, it'd be hard to pull that off on a used car lot. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely spot on, man. <clears throat> Heart cell pack was a uh, required uh, material for all the dip six, which is what uh, I ended up being posted as later when we uh, both my brother and I joined. But uh, Dominic had had that training and and had his hard cell pack had, and had his hard cell hat on. He even he even drummed up some tears, man. I mean, you know, uh, he was he was very concerned. You know, his show of concern was so sincere that it's what basically you know convinced me to to give it a shot. That's really interesting. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to clarify is when you mentioned at the end of the <clears throat> ups and downs in life course, you do an exercise of writing up your overts and withholds. Um, writing up your overts and withholds could be easy, most easily um, compared to going to confession in maybe Catholic church, except you put it into writing mm -hmm. and you put excruciatingly, excruciating detail. Yeah. Um, you're not allowed to just generally say something. You've got to give when it happened, how it happened, where it happened, uh, who else was there, how everything was set up, like excruciating detail. Excruciating and detail. And it's kept in a file, small detail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I wanted to mention that the reason why that would be at the end of a course about suppression and suppressive people is that part of the Hubbard's theory that all Scientologists believe that all bad conditions in your life are the result of you being connected to suppressive people. Uh, there's a there's sort of a, an asterisk there that in order for you to be susceptible to these suppressive people having an influence on you, you have to have already done a bunch of bad things to even yeah. become susceptible to going the effect of these people. Um, and I'm not sure that's not something I've really heard a lot of people talk about when they talk mm -hmm. about, you know, because PTS and SP is a huge component in Scientology. Yeah. But some people might go, well, wait a second, I thought Scientology was about everything that happened to you was your fault. But it sounds like you're able to blame it on suppressive people. They still bring it back to, right. to square one, Laws. which yeah. is, no, you had to do a bunch of bad shit in order for those guys to be able to have that impact on you in the first place. So, um, all right. So I can see how you turn the corner there from Dianetics, don't want to be involved in Scientology, to then actually making that jump. Um, so what happened after the ups and downs in life course? Uh, after that, uh, I think I did the, uh, I started doing the volunteer minister booklet courses because that's all that I could really afford. Uh, it's worth mentioning that I, uh, I, I wasn't in debt at all <laughs> at this time. Um, I did have a, uh, I did have a credit card uh, that had a, like a $1,500 limit on it. but. Uh, I, I paid for the for the purification rundown with a check that my mother wrote. So I had a credit card with fifteen hundred dollars on it. I got the uh, the limit increased to uh, I think twenty five hundred, and uh, that's what paid for the TRs. And uh, then I started doing VM courses, and um, those are these they're, they're tiny little booklets, and they're just little little aspects of uh, uh, Scientology practice, and I could choose. There's a bunch of them, so you can choose what you're interested in. And I did the, uh, uh, the basics of communication. I did the uh, basics of organization, um, uh, relationships, uh, and I think I think for some reason Natasha sold me the uh, marriage 
course. I did the marriage course because it had, she was like, well, there's a lot of good information on ARC, you know, affinity, reality, communication. So I did those. And uh, when I finally completed my uh, Purif, uh, and it took, it just took so long. I ended, there was one time I had to drive down to New Orleans to do an eye check because um, the the hallucinations had diminished in, in severity and duration substantially. But for some reason, they wanted me to go. I think it was really just a kickback to one of their big donators who was a, a opt, uh, optometrist. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, there, you know, he got I had insurance at the time. So, you know, he got to do an examination and whatever. He dilated my eyes. I remember this. I drove back to Baton Rouge with my eyes dilated, which was just the stupidest thing because I can't see shit. I'm driving this huge van and I'm, I'm just like my eyes are just completely dilated and and they even said they're like yeah just come on back you know uh, i'm like is there no one that can drive me or anything like that it's just you know driving with your eyes dilated is probably it's just I, i'm gonna go ahead and tell you you know if you're going to an optometrist and you get your eyes dilated it's a good idea to have someone drive you home dude Don't i've done that. the same thing except <laughs> i went for i went for lasik surgery and i i did it at a place that was out of town from where i was living and there you're supposed to line someone to drive you back. I, I literally had to lie to them and tell them there was someone waiting for me outside. And then I, I drove, I just had, my eyes are fully dilated. I just had LASIK surgery and I'm driving on their freeways. Like I oh can't see God. it. <laughs> Were you on staff at the time? <clears throat> no, this was after. No. Oh, okay. Well then shame on you. <laughs> um, all right. So now you had gotten your brother involved at that time when you were in the Purif. Is he, is he at this point still fully involved? Are your parents? No. Or, no, he's not involved anymore. Um, he actually, um, okay, so after after the Purif was done and I completed it, uh, Travis, my brother, had already went back to Mississippi where he was living. And we were really interested in doing some music together. And there was a, a piano player in Hattiesburg that we were, we were really, really into. Like, and I mean, when I say really into, I mean, this guy, he's a genius. I think he's, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to say, I think he's uh, special. He is special. But um, we went and met with him. Uh, and it, it was almost like meeting a Don of some mafia. He was like, <laughs> we went to a bar and he was, uh, we were talking about music and he was asking us, so what are your influences, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, I brought my guitar and, and uh, played some stuff. And he was like, yeah, I think we could do something, you know. Uh, you come down here and, and uh, we could start a little band or something. So <laughs> me and my brother actually moved to Hattiesburg just to start a band with this guy. Um, and we both got jobs. Uh, we opened up a, a Buffalo Wild Wings. We're part of the uh, original staff at the Buffalo Wild Wings in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And um, but we were only there for about four months and, and the mission kept calling and checking on us. You know, how you guys doing? And you guys, you guys winning, you know, uh, how's the music thing going? But then Dominic started calling, which was the guy who stood in front of the door. So Dominic was doing what we call an, uh, a reach and withdrawal process um, in Scientology terms. Um, and he was uh, pitching me the idea of uh, a mission specifically for artists uh, that was going to be built in California um, on Melrose Avenue. And it was gonna be called Scientology Melrose. And um, there were a lot of, uh, it was an opportunity for, for me and my brother to not only do Scientology and improve our lives further, but to also pursue our music career uh, in a place that, you know, um, could lead to some some opportunities for us um while we were in hattiesburg making some of the best even to this day i'm 37 years old and i still haven't created music as good as what we were creating back then it was it was absolutely fantastic um i started talking to travis about it and um uh, uh you know he was pretty skeptical at first uh but then dominic started talking to him as well and uh, within four months uh, of us living in Hattiesburg, we had uh, decided that we were going to go uh, to California. And 
we had a roommate at the time uh, who, who was interested in coming to, he wasn't a Scientologist, but um, he, he wanted to come along for the ride. So uh, I, the thing was, is I, we didn't have the money to travel, we had to do any of that stuff. So Dominic was like, hey man, all that will be taken care of. We'll get your U-Haul, we'll get you your um, gas money and all, you know, we'll take care of everything. When you're here, you'll have lodging, you'll have everything you need. All you have to do is get here and make the decision to come. So, um, you know, once the decision was made, you know, we told the keyboard player uh, and uh, and we started, we, we, I had to actually finagle an agreement because we'd signed a, a house agreement to at least rent for a year. And so I, uh, I agreed to pay for four months or we were there for four months. I agreed to pay for two months and then continue to pay for the rest of the year and they could rent it out. So they'd be getting double their money for the property that we were renting in the house. So I, I, I had to do some, you know, things in, in real life to uh, sort of accommodate this, this thing to happen. And uh, once we got all that squared away, um, there was kind of a tearful goodbye with, uh, with our friend, the piano player, and our our very strange neighbor who made awesome tacos, <clears throat> um, and we left and headed towards uh, the West Coast. Okay, so your brother was still on board with you at this time. Yeah. Okay, so this became the Scientology mission of Melrose. Yes. Um, he the the Dom, Dominic was talking about this mission and. Tom and Kathy Steiner were the uh, mission holders, and they had uh, some they had some support from uh, CCLA, CCN, uh, and public from CC. Because here's here's how it was pitched: some of the public that were at CC did not like the Sea Org presence at CC. And some of the second generation Scientologists that they wanted to get on lines, on course, whatever, uh, weren't really liking the Sea Org presence and how they were handled with ethics and stuff. Um, so the idea was to make a mission. And Rachel Miner, who was uh, uh, the initial donor for the mission, uh, not sure if you know that name, but that was. Uh, yeah, she was married to Macaulay Culkin. Yeah, um, very sweet girl, uh, very compassionate person. Um, and she had donated the initial money to to get it started, to kickstart it. And uh, Tom and Kathy, I don't know how they got hooked up with her, um, but however they did, they did. And they got some of her money and not that they needed it because <laughs> Tom and Kathy are rich, but um, it got this whole Scientology Melrose thing started because they wanted a mission where CC public or public that didn't fit in at CC or even people who had children who were second generation Scientologists who weren't even on lines at CC or any org uh, could go and feel comfortable and not pressured to do it. So yeah, some of these LA area missions sort of um, corner that market of being, uh kind of a cool low stress low pressure place where you can go on course and again i, I kind of ask myself why why didn't these guys even want to be on course like why do they give a shit but let's say they're being pressured by all their friends and their parents to be on course they can at least be like all right i'll go to the mission whether it's los Feliz or the one you're talking about well, the one you're talking about again is which one melrose melrose los Feliz or melrose they can be on course. They're not going to be harassed to put in a lot of hours per week. They can maybe right. go two or three hours per week. You know, a lot of time their friends are there as well. Yep. They can say they're on course. They can stop being harassed um, and and kind of be in an area where there's a lot of people they like. As opposed yeah. to at Celebrity Center International, they're going to be harassed. They're going to be sometimes recruited. They're going to be mm -hmm. sent to ethics for not yeah. being dedicated enough. That's mm -hmm. never going to happen at the Melrose Mission or at the Los Los Feliz is the one where Patrick Renna is the mission, yeah. owner, right? Right, right. Well, were you guys was... competing with Los Feliz for being like the cool spot to be? 
No, we weren't competing actually. Uh, actually, Patrick was very supportive of the Melrose mission in the beginning, uh, but but Melrose was anything but any of those things you just said, where someone oh. could go and be, you know, kind of haphazard, uh, namby pamby pantyways dilettante. Um, so, like, what it ended up being was another Steiner mission, which is a fundamentalist church um, they, they were hardcore oh yeah oh yeah now it looked like it was one of those cool hip bohemian chill i mean the furniture alone man the amount of money it was just insane because we raised money for for six months to to build this place and uh the, just the furniture it was all teak wood teak wood everywhere uh teak furniture teak chairs teak tables uh teak floors I mean, it's just phenomenal the amount of uh, money we raised. We had a list of uh, of OTs that we got to call uh, every day for six months, just sitting in a call room um, and, and basically guilt tripping uh, <laughs> OTs to give us money. Um, and so, anyways, yeah, the uh, like like you said, the Lost Felix mission. I, what I remember from it uh, because I. I, I Patrick was involved in the Melrose mission a lot in the beginning, as were as was Rachel Miner, Hal Ozan, uh, Wes Beecher, um, who is a I think a third generation Scientologist, um, uh, some other people that I don't want to name because they don't want to be named. But um, there were there was there was these people that were connected with all these little networks of celebrity Scientologists that weren't necessarily celebrities themselves. So uh, some of them were, some of them weren't. And uh, they were all very interested in this idea because they pitched it uh, and, and Rachel was under the understanding that the same understanding that I was, that this was going to be a hip, cool place that was gonna be low pressure, very chill. Part of the reason they wanted me to, to join was because of my ex previous experience uh, being a stage manager uh, for UA Nashville. And I had experience working with celebrities. So um, they wanted me to do open mic nights and do events, do event management, uh, like plan events with these people. Uh, and for the most part, uh, you know, I was pretty, what they would say, in calm with, uh, with that community. And I had my you know, finger on the pulse of that group. And I fit in well with them, whereas some of the other staff members, uh, even though I was still very much, uh, once I got to Ventura and got my initial training, became a fundamentalist in a lot of ways, I was still able to uh, uh, connect with these sort of out ethics particles that, uh, <laughs> you know, the third gener second and third generation Scientology kids that were just not getting their shit together. Um, they liked me, you know, I was a musician. Uh, I had experience in the in the professional music business. And um, there were a lot of things. That, and also I didn't get the whole, I never really have gotten starstruck with people. Um, and except for one time when I met Juliet Lewis at GC, I, I totally like fumble. Because I had a big crush on her when I was growing up. But everyone else even when i met back i was you know this is whatever um just another person you know i really admire and respect people's work but i also understand that 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 it, how i understand how it feels to be treated like a, uh like a novelty you know and uh that's how a lot of celebrities or that's a lot of celebrities uh encounter that as a result of their fame you know i can't get a picture with you you know like uh like they don't want to talk they don't want to say oh hey how's it going you know they're just like i want a picture you know what i mean that's like the first thing they go to and it's like i'm a person you know i'm a person too you want to interact with me interact with me like a person so that was one of the things that i was particularly good at and what i was used for um at melrose to uh, to reg people, to reg Rachel over and over and over again, uh, to reg Hal and to get Hal Ozan, which was Rachel's boyfriend at the time. Um, he he was 
starring in 90210 and had a bunch of friends that, uh, I mean, he had a list of friends that was like superstars, you know? So, you know, they were always trying to get me to get somebody from his network of people into Scientology. And he would, he would, he would get some certain people. He was like, Hey, you call me like, yeah, there's somebody that I want to bring in, but can you make sure that the mission is kind of like, you know, there's not a lot of people there so that we can do a special cycle for them. You know what I mean? Um, and, and then we did that, but you know, in the, in between those times, like, you know, uh, when I watched the going clear documentary, I feel like I'm trailing in and out here, but that's okay. We don't have to stay on one specific train of thought. And I, I keep, if we need to go back to an earlier train of thought, we'll do it. Okay. Well, when I watched the going clear uh, <clears throat> uh, documentary, and I saw a Spanky Taylor story. Um, of course, I didn't have a child, so this was a that's, that's a whole other order of magnitude. Uh, when she described her child covered and you know her eyes were glued shut, basically shut from all of the uh, gunk that was in her eyes, and her she hadn't had her diaper changed. So it's a different order of magnitude. But when she told the story about how she was used continuously for her connection with John. Um, I related to that big time because I would set up these events or I deal with these celebrities. I read these celebrities uh, or, you know, semi celebrities and their people in their networks. And then and then for some reason, I'd be in all this ethics trouble and they'd like literally confine me to a hole or put me on uh, an ethics handling or send me back to Ventura. And uh, people would ask, you know, where's Marcus at? And uh, oh well, he's he's doing a he's doing a training program up in Ventura or whatever. But well, really, what I was doing was the state's project force, which means manual labor, which means slave labor. And uh, and then when they needed me, Let me I have to jump in with a question, even though it's going to interrupt your train of thought. Because <clears throat> when you and I were talking on the phone a couple of days ago, you kept mentioning the word EPF in a way that didn't make sense to me. Are right. you talking about someone putting you on mess work? Yeah. Estates Project okay. Force. <clears throat> so the Estates Project Force is specifically a word for the Sea Org boot camp. Okay. Um, and that EPF does do a lot of messed work. Okay, so messed work in Scientology just means physical labor. Um, now, when someone's in ethics trouble, whether they're a Sea Org member or just a normal Scientologist, but normally if they're a staff member of any kind at a church or at a mission, they will be put on to doing physical labor. It's supposed to get you out of your head, yep. you know. <clears throat> Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. When you say put me on the EPF, you just mean have me do physical labor. Right. Well, the, the Tom, Tom and Kathy referred to it as EPF. Uh, so okay. it's, They're using that word like idiots. Well, they. I mean, hey, you know, they, they <laughs> were. <laughs> mm. I, I'm, I'm surprised they would say that. Um, uh, one of the other terms that someone – now, Tom and Kathy have been around forever, so they might have uh, misappropriated certain um, uh, seer yeah. words and used them colloquially. Yeah. But like another phrase I wouldn't be surprised if they had been using was put you on the decks. Putting yeah, someone yeah. on the decks also means just just go do, just scrub shit. I, just go I, I heard that. Oh, that, that, that's, that's what I would be doing. I would scrub the floor with mineral oil. They had this very beautiful wooden floor at the Buena Ventura mission. And uh, anytime I would like fail them in getting someone in, like there was one time we had a, a, a cycle that went, horribly wrong with Rachel. And it was because when we raised the money for the mission, uh, the HCO terminal that was gonna be for Melrose uh, and I were, were there doing mess work all the time. And this wasn't a punishment, this was just to prepare to get the mission open. And um, at that time, there were other people at Buenaventura who were either doing training or they were, um, uh, on staff at the Ventura mission. Uh, so it was just me and John at the Melrose mission for the first, uh, like as it was being built um, for the first six months or so. Like it took about, it took a few months to raise the money and then we got all of the money and then, that, then they sent me and John down there. John was a licensed electrician and had worked in construction most of his life and could do a lot of different construction projects. So. I was his helper, and while we were in LA, um, there were uh, assignments that'd be given, like to go reg people, 
And this one particular assignment, uh, I was told to meet Rachel Miner at Starbucks, um, which was just right down the road, 7709 Melrose Avenue. And I was supposed to get, a, there was no, there was no target. It was get as much as you can from her. And uh, I asked for a number and I, and um, they wouldn't give me one. So I, I started asking, you know, like, what do you want? You want 30,000? You want 50,000? You want 7,000? You mean 8,000? Well, how much? And they're just like, make it go right. So I go over to, it was like eight or nine in the morning. I go over to Starbucks and Rachel's sitting there drinking her coffee. I go get my coffee and I sit down and I'm just like worn out, completely worn out. Been sleeping on insulation out on the uh, patio of the mission for, for weeks and pretty sleep deprived because John, it was just two of us and John had that, what they call in the, uh, well, CI, you know, command intention, like he was very tone 40, like, let's get this shit done, gung ho. Um, let's get it done, you know, we got shit to do. So he was, he was pissed off that they sent me instead of him because, you know, he felt he could get it done better than I could, uh, I suppose. And also I got to go have coffee, you know, like when you're on staff, those kind of things are kind of nice to be able to just step away from the craziness, you know, and, and, and go out into the matrix, so to speak. And, um, uh, so I was there talking to uh, Rachel and and I had a moment, dude, like it was a very, very vivid moment of cognitive dissonance where I realized I haven't done any music since I've been here. All I've been doing is raising money for this church. And here I am raising money. And here is this person whose boyfriend is a, a very, uh, like he, he was doing very well musically at the time with his band and, uh, and had a network of people who were into music, who were very hip. And uh, I was like, you know, I, I could easily jump out of this cult. And at the time I wasn't thinking cult, but I could easily leave and just hang out with this group of people. But then again, I couldn't because they were all Scientologists. So there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. And she noticed this and she was like, what is wrong? You know, like what's going on? And, and, and but she was very concerned. And she was like, what, uh, I, I started to explain to her in terms that I could without breaking her ARC, you know, cause that was, I was trying to get money from her. And, uh, you know, she was like, well, what are, what, what are we meeting here for? You know, Tom and Kathy told me to come meet you here. And, uh, and I was like, I, I don't know. I, I was sort of having a little, mental breakdown and, and she and she was like are you okay uh i've been sleep deprived i've been working all the time and she's like are, are you okay and i'm like no i'm not okay and she, and she and she was concerned she became the she became the auditor in that situation and was like you know well what is it you know what can i help you with and i was like well i'm not doing my music i'm not really i'm not really feeling like i'm in the right place like uh but i couldn't tell her i couldn't bear to tell her that i hadn't been sleeping that i've been sleeping out on a on a insulation and and that i'd been on uh on the decks as you said you know like the the for, for weeks and my fingernails were just torn up and from the mineral oil seeping into my uh fingernails and turning them into essentially like just goop like i had no fingernails um and uh she was like she was like she said the funniest thing she said it, could i like do you, is, is, do you want a rec she, she reached over and touched my shoulder and said do, do you want a record deal is that what you want <laughs> and i was just like i just kind of hung my head and i was like that's whenever i got out of the cognitive dissonance and i was like got back on purpose as they say and i was like look um we need we need another donation you know we need some money i don't care how much it is but that's what i'm here for and i just told her straight up like that you know uh and she was like okay i understand 
and she pulled out her checkbook and she wrote a check for eight thousand dollars and gave it to me and she literally just got up and walked away there was a real moment and a real connection that we had and i basically just went quack severed it and so i want money you know and it wasn't about me she it wasn't about you know she was actually reaching and i just went quack, money give me money and then I went back to the mission and uh, John saw the check and he was like, you know, what the fuck is this? $8,000 is nothing. Yeah, I should fucking, I should, I'm going to, I'm going to write you, I'm going to write a fucking KR right now and you, I'm going to sign you a condition of enemy and you need to fucking get your ass back up there and go to work or I'm not, you know what? I'm driving you back to Ventura tonight and we're going to get you in ethics. And he did. He drove me back to Ventura and before you know it, I was back in ethics. Uh, so that's Spanky Taylor's story. That's how I relate to that because they get you to do something that they can't do because you don't have, they don't have the calm line. They don't have the, the connection, you know, the emotional connection with somebody to just, to just basically get what they want out of them. Just like Spanky got the, the special uh, viewing, the tape for Saturday Night Fever. You know, they pulled her out of the, the hole or whatever. <clears throat> to get what they wanted. And then once they got what they wanted, it's like, Back to ethics with you, bitch. Right. What, what was Rachel like? Um, I, at this point, I think she was divorced from uh, Macaulay. Yeah. Yeah. For quite. I just, for quite I just a call it Macaulay because we're bros. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, she, she was she spending her own money? Did she have money from the marriage? Like, why was she such a donor in Scientology? She was never. I mean, yeah. she acts, but she's never been. Her biggest movie was Bully. Um, at that time. And uh, if you've never seen it, it's actually really worth seeing. Uh, she plays a real psychotic bitch. Um, but her, uh, I, I, I never got into her details about her marriage, really. She talked about, she called him Mac, but um, uh, she, she talked about him uh, very rarely. Uh, but I get the feeling, I got the feeling that she got, you know, some assets and money out of the marriage and stuff uh, from the divorce i should say from the divorce and uh, it, that could have possibly been uh some of the reason why uh they didn't speak so much at the time you know but they did talk uh maybe he still gave her money i don't know if they were still friends i mean Matt, you know, dude's pretty pretty loaded so um I don't think he was ever involved in any Scientology in any way, shape, or form. And I don't know if Rachel only got into Scientology after the divorce mm -hmm. or if it's just one of those things they never had in common and might have contributed to the divorce. I really don't know anything about it. I think, um, that, I think personally, I think that was part of it. I think that she started getting into Scientology and he was like, fuck all that. Yeah. That's just what I think. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what was the last train of thought we were on before that? <laughs> It was, um, well, I think it's really interesting that you point out that you had been, uh, your, your, the recruitment pitch that you got to go and do this project in LA mm -hmm. was based on appealing to your desire to forward your career. Right. Uh, take, take maybe an important next step. And then you wind up there. Next thing you know, you sort of realize you've been doing nothing but busting your ass for Scientology for next to nothing doing nothing on your career. What, what's the next important step in this whole process that happens after this incident with Rachel? Um, well, there was, a, there was a big event. Um, of course, there was the, uh, the grand opening. This happened after that, but there was a big event that needed to be planned. And since uh, John had reported me and uh, wrote this really really toxic kr and it went straight up to kathy and kathy and tom like sat me down and did a handling and they were like you know this is not acceptable you should have gotten way more money than what Hold you on. did the only thing you're in trouble for here is not getting enough money they didn't find out about the weird conversation that happened correct yeah holy shit well actually john no that may not be true because i did tell john that I had a, uh, that, that I told her that I wasn't happy. 
you know, when she asked me, is there something wrong? And I was like, yeah, something's not right. I told John that and, and he that's when he flipped out. That's when he completely flipped out and was like, what the fuck? You know, you fucking DB. I'm going to write this shit up. I'm taking you to Ventura. So I don't know what he wrote in the KR. I never got to see it. But uh, Tom and Kathy uh, did uh, sit me down and talk about, you know, you didn't get enough. And but. Uh, there was uh, there was a lot of mess work, and then but but then there was some events that needed planning, and there were some contacts that uh, like with Patrick, I had a good line with Patrick, and uh, Patrick had a uh, you know a lot of a lot of people that he knew that could make things happen, and um, so what we did, what we ended up doing, and this was in the beginning stages of us starting to reg Patrick to start his own mission. Uh, in Los Feliz. Oh, this and, was even before he had the Los Feliz mission? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Pa Patrick was a donor for the Melrose mission. Uh, and as time went on, um, he became a target for, uh, so, you know, starting his own mission and starting another mission similar to the Melrose mission just to have another place another another cool place and he also wanted to do it because he saw that what was going on at melrose wasn't exactly what we said it was going to be um so i had a pretty decent line with patrick probably the best set of, uh, of all of us that were assigned at melrose and i told him that we needed to do an event for uh fundraising for melrose this was before he was even uh considering opening his own mission and uh He's like, okay, cool. I got some ideas. Uh, let me see if I can put something together. And uh, so I ended up talking to a girl named Jessica Sterling, who's a photographer at, uh, online at CC. And um, and she had a, a friend that booked over at the Knitting Factory, which was a, a pretty swanky little place to play uh, on Sunset Boulevard. And um we had to arrange a private event uh which was not very common for the knitting factory it's usually public events but uh so we had to raise the money get it to start get it to uh jessica so that jessica could get it to the guy that could exchange the money for the private time and then patrick set up um as far as i know he set up the the gig where um Beck and Juliet Lewis and the Hanks played, and the Hanks were like uh, a really awesome band that was. They were all online at CC, third, second or third generation Scientologists, and um, that gig I never got to go to. Uh, I really wish I could have because that would have been a hell of a show. Beck played just acoustic; I didn't have his full band with him or anything. Juliet had her full band, and she headlined the show, and the Hanks. Uh, played uh before Beck. So the the Hanks opened, then Beck played, and then Julia played. Um and that was a fundraiser for the Melrose mission. Um and it helped to fund the grand opening of the Melrose mission. And the grand opening had um that's where we pulled out all the stops and 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 they were like, you know, uh, we're going to throw this big party in Laurel Canyon, and uh, we need you to tell everyone to invite everyone they know from, you know, CC public to come to this party um, and and spread the word. And because uh, we had leaflets, flyers and stuff that, you know, this date, this time, this is when the grand opening is. So we threw this big party at the. Uh, at the, 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 it's a house that used to have like tigers and stuff in it. Uh, they had a, they literally had a tiger, tiger cages built in the back of the house. Uh, anyone who's been down uh, Laurel Canyon has seen this house at, uh, before a certain point it burned down. But uh, it was a big blue house, big blue mansion. And you could rent it out. It was uh, a lot of people rented it out for private parties and stuff. So we had this party. Everyone uh, that we could get together from the CC public in that demographic of the second 
generation Scientologist uh, was there and uh, there was a bunch of bands played and that in fact I have a CD here that we produced I don't have the cover but uh, this is a CD that uh, we produced that has a lot of the bands how do you see it? like Melrose Music League is what it says this is a, a CD that we produced for very cheap to sell at that event and um, and also to promote the grand opening so um, the grand opening we had people like Jason Lee Beck uh, the, the who's the other guy in that show with Jason Lee the um, oh Danny Mast no oh, oh, oh um the big dude Ethan Suplee yeah. Ethan was there. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Danny Masterson and his brother were there. Was there? Uh, Giovanna, Giovanni Rabisi's brother was there. I don't think Giovanni was there. If he was, he was incognito. Um, there were tons. Brother? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. It was either. Well, maybe it's Danny's brother. I know Danny's got a brother. Um, yeah. But uh, it was just tons and tons of the, you know. The at, at that time the second generation Scientologists and some and some of like people like Jason Lee and Juliet Lewis uh, were there. I was like put into the Div Six room and like doing BMO the whole time, preparing for it. They didn't want me anywhere near any of these people. <laughs> um, and come the time of the event, uh, they put me in charge of the stage in the back where Hal Ozan was playing, and I did sound and set all that stuff up. Uh, there's, uh, there was, I was, I was very much on a tight leash. Everybody had the, uh, the radios, you know, like the, you know, like the, the Secret Service type radios. <laughs> so they were constantly, Marcus, where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Because they didn't What's want me. Morning? Yeah, which try I don't want you anywhere near any of these celebrities. Um and we did the grand opening and uh they played uh Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles and we did this massive balloon release and uh uh every every shop on Melrose was just aghast that there was a Scientology mission near their shop. They were like, Well, there goes my property value. Um <laughs> And 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 once the mission was open, it was like uh, feet on the street, selling books up and down Melrose all day long, eight to twelve hours a day, sometimes longer. I mean, I had to get uh, you know how you get paid on staff. It ain't much. There was a, uh, but my feet were so bad that I actually would buy <clears throat> lotion before I would buy food because my feet were so cracked. And, and and it hurt so bad to walk that I mean I would spend twenty dollars on this Norwegian lotion that was the only thing that would like keep my feet from completely drying out. Um and but Travis, my brother, he was still on staff. Uh over over the course of a year or so, you know, we got some uh some good some some good leads on some celebrities. Uh and uh we got them in there and some of them stayed some of them some of them were like what the fuck i'm out of here and but that was the goal of the melrose mission and but once once we opened um and patrick came to a few of the open mic nights um he quickly realized that it was just like cc it was just like every other damn uh like hardcore mission or or even org um in my opinion uh the, those missions are the closest thing to being run as an org the steiner missions now they weren't they weren't orgs but it from what i saw from being on uh, course courses and training at cc and la day um it was the closest thing that i could compare to being on staff at an org because it was just very controlled very regimented ethics were harsh and severe and uh, and if if you didn't adhere to the programs that were written by the CS for you, 
then uh, Tom and Kathy would come and um, everyone was afraid of them. And every, it was like, I mean, there was one night they made us do TR0 uh, from, from 7 p.m. Like they closed the mission, closed the doors, locked the doors and said, okay, we're going to do TR0 until you guys get it. Okay, so that was like, I don't know, 16 hours of sitting there staring at each other. <laughs> um, and stuff like that was fairly common, you know, these really rid these really harsh punishments for, uh, for, for minor issues. And um, so let me ask uh, you a question. Yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> because of the exposure of that Scientology has been getting, um, from things like Scientology in the aftermath. Yeah. Um, and because there's, um, well, I guess I'll say a, a selection bias that the information you hear about, the stories that you hear about, particularly on a show that is as high profile as Scientology in the aftermath. And I yeah. include my story in this. Mm -hmm. Because there's such a, it's, it's such a distillation of some really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. It, it's a it's a huge positive that these kind of um, things are getting exposure. But one of the results that I guess I would chalk up as a negative is that it's very easy for people to um, hear about things like this and go, "How could anybody fall for such a fucking cult like this?" Yeah. The reason why I call that reaction a negative is because um, creating outrage is one thing, and it has its place, and it. And it has its purpose, but creating understanding is even more important, in my opinion. And I think that um, if someone is brought to a point of just outrage and uh, disbelief, it's not very productive. I think it's more productive for them to get to a place where they go, oh, I see how somebody can get sucked up in something like this. Because if they get to a place of understanding, mm -hmm. then you can be sure that person's not going to be sucked into that trap. If they just get brought to a point of outrage and misunderstanding, then they're still naively confident that it could never happen to them. And I think it's important for people to understand how good, intelligent, well-meaning people do get involved in stuff like this, and they don't see it. The day-to-day -day experience of living in this is not the same as just what you see on TV or just what you see in some interviews or whatever. Um, so that's all a big intro to the question I really want to ask you. Okay. During all this time, the way you're describing this, it, it sounds like someone could go, wow, how could you get sucked up into something like that? How could you not see that you were bait and switched? How could you not see that you were being slowly boiled like a frog? My right. question is this. Did you feel like you were in a cult during this time? Um, there, the, the short answer is no because uh, belief at a certain point, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, the short answer is no. The long answer is that I've been doing a lot of uh, research and reading myself on, on how I you know, got to that point, you know, because after, even after I left the cult, uh, there was years where I was quote independent and still followed the, the teachings and, and uh, stuff of L. Ron Hubbard. So uh, there was a, a point where, you know, I, through, through learning and through uh, studying psychology and psychiatry and the things that are so horrible and evil in, in, in Scientology uh, that uh, I learned about certain things like the Milgram experiments and the Ash conformity experiments and um how you have um this uh well back in the nuremberg trials like uh people were asking the same kind of questions aaron like how could you be so stupid in such a destructive organization that performed these inhuman experiments on on people and, and children and and just be so dehumanized how could you be part of the Nazi party, you know, like, uh, and you know what the answer, the, the, the answer for most of these people on trial, do you know what their answer was? Tell me. 
their answer to those questions was it was my job I, I, that's what i was going to say but i didn't want to <laughs> i was just doing my job i was just doing my job and uh so after the nuremberg trials that's when the the milgram experiments took place the ash conformity experiments took place and the the, the purpose of those experiments uh, was to see how far people would go to obey or adhere to authority when that meant hurting other people. Was that the experiment about um, someone thinks they're administering electric shocks? That would be the, uh, uh, it's, yeah. That's, Is that a that's different the experiment or it's no, along no, the no. same lines? It's, it's along the same lines. The ash, the, uh, ash conformity experiments uh, would, were, were not the electric shock ones. Uh, the Milgram experiments, I believe, were the electric shock ones. The ash conformity experiments was a group thing where they would, they had uh, what they would call um, confederates that were basically paid parts of the experiment that knew what the experiment was. And they would try to get uh, one person in the group to conform to their ideas. Okay, so, um up to 80 percent of the subjects wouldn't conform if there was only one other person but if there was a group it was upwards of 90 you know percent you know like a very high percent and and the other thing is the reactive mind you know like the concept of the reactive mind um <clears throat> when you have that in your uh belief uh matrix then literally it, it, it's a it's a very very powerful control mechanism that uh it is very it's it's a freudian thing it's a neo-freudian thing because you cannot prove that the id exists it's part of your unconscious subconscious mind so anything that uh hubbard says about the bank or the reactive mind um, which is the same thing um is talking about a subject that there is no proof that it even exists. But the belief that it exists can have some psychological effects, something called belief perseverance, um, especially when you combine it with conformity and some of the things that were discovered in Milgram's experiment. So, um, you know, your matrix parallels are, are spot on, man. You know, I took some notes on your video uh, the, the blue pill in Scientology is refusing to take responsibility for your dynamics after you've been awoken. Uh, the red pill in Scientology is accepting responsibility for your dynamics and applying Scientology, essentially becoming a fundamentalist. Uh, and, but then there's the blue pill after Scientology. What it really is, is just reintegrating into life and people and, and relationships. Uh, but what they say it is is it's you're you're not ising yourself you know like when you read the comments about uh when you left and you sent the email out and you got you know blow your fucking brains out you know and all that stuff the concept there is you the, after you left you're not ising yourself you're in a permanent state of inability to as is your bank and overts on, and you have all these overts on your dynamics uh you're out of exchange with all of your dynamics um and as far as the red pill goes what they say it would be like is like you're living with the fact that you've been outside the matrix knowing that you failed you have failed after you reintegrate into the wall world um and you failed at a level that's just so so like immeasurable immensely immeasurable you failed humanity you failed humanity you know um but what it really is is a process by over time which you know uh from do another matrix uh reference there is no spoon you know you realize <laughs> that there is no <laughs> spoon <laughs> and that scientology is just a big scam and it's a pseudoscience it has some positive effects like i said in the beginning when we were talking about some of the things that got me into it uh, and even some of the things later on like uh there are some things that you can't you can't really say that you didn't get something out of it. There are positive aspects that you uh, carry with you, but um, over on the whole, you know, it's uh, it's 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 not healthy. You know, especially the the belief that the reactive mind has these kinds of 
controls over people. And so that's really my goal, like uh, with with uh, what I'm trying to show in, in on my channel is like break down psychologically. Uh, and, and, and as far as the Leah Remini thing you mentioned, uh, I, I, I can't say that I watched much of it, but you make a really good point whenever uh, you say. And, and I like the way that you're very careful in how you say it, because I'm with you. I'm 100 percent behind anything that exposes the abuses of Scientology. Like, you know, go, go do it, you know. But there is an element there sometimes of uh, the freak show, you know, like, uh, how could you be so stupid? <clears throat> and mm. and showing how smart people, very intelligent people, you're in a you're a very intelligent person. I'm a very intelligent person. Uh, you know, and it's not just stupid people that get involved. Now, of course, there are people like that, but um, how does one get to a point to where that happens? And there are a, what I'm learning and what I'm finding is that there are some uh, environmental factors and then there's some internal factors, you know, and uh, lack, lack of sleep, lack of food, um, all this leads to something that is very, very sinister when you, when you start to examine it, when you, when you sleep deprived, when someone is sleep deprived and they uh, are then awoken during REM sleep, in other words, not allowed to get a good night's sleep and they're not, and they're not, uh, their nutrition is bad and stuff like that. What starts to happen in the brain is something called the brain derived neurotropic factor. Well, that causes something to happen in the brain that allows the brain the chance to make new neural stem cells. And that allows the brain to grow new brain cells. That's the only time you can do that besides when you're an, a fetus in the womb. So people who've been exposed to continuous sleep deprivation, continuous uh, nutritional deficiencies, and uh, not allowed to rest properly after, after long periods of sleep deprivation will have brain-derived neurotrophic factors and thus basically grow new neurons. And the problem, do you see the problem there? <laughs> because then if you're in the group and you've got these new brain cells. I mean, the body works on a, on a very basic way. Like it's gonna use the newest stuff. Like it's kind of like every Christmas, someone wants the newest toy and the newest gadget. The body just wants the newest cell. You know, I want the best cell that I can possibly use and I want it to work optimally perfect. So if you have new brain cells that are being created and you're in a cult, I mean, it just doesn't, it's a, it's a very toxic mixture. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad you mentioned two two things that I think <clears throat> I'm so glad that you mentioned them. Hmm. Um the the dynamic of of going along and following others hmm. and the international events that Scientology holds five to seven times a year, depending. Um well I know it's 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 six. Uh, yeah, I think there's six main international events. Um even Leah in her book and on the show made reference to how going to these events and watching and listening to what was being not only to what was being presented mm -hmm. but also to how everybody else present at the event was responding to what was being presented yeah that these events in many instances made her doubt and question um herself in respect to a lot of the doubts and questions that had been coming up Right, so she's she's hearing what's being said on stage. She's seeing uh, the overwhelming response from everybody present, and she goes, "Maybe it's just me. I'm just the fucked up one. I'm the one with the crazy fucked up doubts, and I need to quiet that inner voice that's telling me something's wrong. Because clearly, if something was wrong, all these people would not be responding so so positively to all of this stuff. Right? That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and and also you mentioned this point of the reactive mind. Well, the way Hubbard lays out this whole body of information um, <clears throat> is like if you are embarked upon what seems to be a pro-survival route, 
um, you know, helping people, doing, you know, anything positive, it's your reactive mind that is the source of any doubts or criticisms. I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that, but it's necessary in this, mm -hmm. in this um, that, uh, example. And so if you really, if you start embarking upon that path in Scientology and the, and the first steps of Scientology are educating about the reactive mind, because mm -hmm. Dianetics and Scientology really are not two different disciplines or subjects. They're the same thing. If you really start to buy this, which starts at the very early levels, then once you get involved a couple years down the line, especially if you're a staff member and you don't have a lot of, um, uh, you're susceptible to just doing what people tell you because you, you don't consider yourself to be an expert, you're just kind of a worker bee. Mm -hmm. Anybody can come along and, and it, like, if you start having doubts or criticisms, anybody can come along and be like, you know that's your reactive mind. Right, you just mm -hmm. just totally write right off, just completely dismiss and write off any of these complaints or pushbacks or objections. They let's say you're bitching about being overworked, you're bitching about not being paid enough, you're bitching about whatever. People mm -hmm. like stop dramatizing your reactive mind, stop dramatizing case on post. Right, no case you know, on post. That's that's the bad, but that's that's what, we are here to handle the reactive mind of the world. You don't have the luxury of dramatizing your own reactive mind. Tuck that shit down, mm -hmm. hide that, you know, in the back, and get on with uh, get, getting the show on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, these two factors. Wax enthusiastic. <laughs> wax enthusiastic, and you will very soon feel so. <laughs> you know what? I, as I sit here right now, I cannot tell you if wax enthusiastic <laughs> is only a phrase that exists in Scientology. I don't oh. know if any non-Scientologist would know what wax enthusiastic means. I think it is in the dictionary. It's just one of these things no one... <laughs> no it's the joy of creation, y'all. No one uses that word. So um, now, it, you no, know, no. in order to spur people to action, it is necessary oftentimes to enrage them. Mm. Um, and I just feel I that it's very important to follow up that kind of um, awareness and that kind of reaction with full education. Because yeah. if you just think that the Scientology experience is a, a crazy cult experience, then it also doesn't cause you to truly empathize with the people who joined it or, or were in it for so long. It makes you think that those people must be crazy or stupid. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about an ego thing of I don't want people to think that about me. I mean, it doesn't help anyone if that is the impression that's created because it's a false impression. Right. And it's not about me trying to make people think Oh, don't Scientology is not that bad. No, Scientology is as bad as you hear. It's just that if you don't, if you're left with the impression, oh, that could never happen to me, or how could that happen to anybody, then you don't understand yet. Absolutely. And it is valuable to understand because it could happen to you. It could happen to your friend. It could happen to your family member. And and it's much more important to me for people to understand that it could happen to people that are close to them, as opposed to oh, that could. They're so crazy. That could never happen. No, it could happen. <laughs> Yeah, very. <clears throat> I mean, it's um, it, it, it's. I'm learning more about how. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, class, a couple of a couple of classes this semester uh, that I've had to step out because my uh, professor was talking about things that uh, in, indicated um, some of the things that happened. Uh, Things that happened in the church, and in a in a way that made perfect sense, uh, but it was so personal to me that I had to like it. I got me quite emotional, you know. Uh, especially uh, some of the stuff that I just brought up about the um, uh, the experiments, the Ash conformity experiments, and Milgram and uh, them, some of the behavioral theories and uh, but mostly the Freudian stuff because the Freudian stuff is just so freaking sinister because it assigns a uh, unknown unknowable element to your problems and uh, until Carl Rogers came along and started to change the, the views of, of, of many psychologists and introduced uh, positive psychology um and third force which is more humanistic uh psychology um uh it, it was a, a grim thing you know therapy was uh 
therapy and psychology, uh, even up into the, you know, 90s is sort of like, oh, you're in therapy? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, and, and, and unbelievably, there's still people who practice and use uh, some of these uh, neo-Freudian and Freudian uh, concepts in their diagnosis of people, even up to the state level. Um, in my divorce, I, I had to go see a state evaluator and he was very Freudian, man. And I'm just, you know, at the time I wasn't a student of psychology. So I was just going along and doing my doing my part that the court, uh, court ordered. But uh, looking back, I'm like, wow, that guy is the is the guy for the state of Louisiana. And he is like super Freudian. Like he really thinks that, uh, you know, there's you know, the, 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 the id, the superego, and the ego are like, you know, uh, super relevant. Right. And uh, the thing is, is it's, uh, there's, you would agree that in Scientology, there's a ton of tools to manipulate people, right? Absolutely. And so like, where do those tools come from, you know? Um, and are and why are they considered tools? And why are ex Scientologists uh, seemingly so much better at getting people to do what they want them to do? Um, there's some there's some real uh, information that, uh, as you said, in some of the exposés that have been coming out recently that uh, talk a lot about the abuses and talk a lot about how bad it is, but don't really um, explain or have that element of this is how it can happen, you know, and uh, that's, that's, that's essentially my goal is to uh, to explain that in a way and to show it really, I really want to show it, uh, you know, because people, a uh, picture's worth a thousand words, you know, um, and, a, and a video is worth, you know, who knows, a million. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the fact that you and I are doing videos is great. And um, I think we should continue to do so. Um, but my, my main focus for, showing uh i have a real purpose for what you said is showing um how it happens to people that think it could never happen to them because like i said when i joined i was like fuck religion you know like double fuck you like just like i had no interest no desire at all to be involved with any religion of any kind and yet it happened to me so let me ask you this um Perfect opportunity for this question. Once that guy basically was like, okay, you got to at least give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it this one course. By the end of that course, did you feel like you were now involved in a religion, but you were okay with it? Or did you get to the end of that course and you were like, oh, I get it. It's not religious. So right. I'm cool with it. No, you, that's a good question. I, I would, uh, and I have a simple answer because Paul Haggis said it pretty much the same way that I thought about it. It was like, oh, some kind of tax thing. Like, I don't care. You know, if they're helping me, this information makes sense. I could care less because I don't care about that. I care about as much uh, about religion as I do about government. I don't trust them, you know, I don't care. I don't want to give them my money either way, religion or government. But did you feel that this was, did you feel you were now in a religion? No, I really didn't. I didn't feel like I was in a religion. Did you get the sense that the people around you felt they were in a religion? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you did? I mean, yeah, I mean, some people, yeah. There were, because it was a Steiner mission, you know, there were some people there that were just so, like the doctor and his wife, and uh, there was another guy there that, that did the initial uh, OCA eval for me, the Oxford Capacity Analysis uh, test which is the personality test that you take when you go in. Like there were some people, but not, not, not an overwhelming majority, but there were some people there who I felt that were like, you know, knew they were a part of a religious group. So let me, um, let me ask this a different way. Um, 
because when I say part of a religion, I don't um, like obviously someone's level of dedication and their 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 fervor and their um, uh, you know the degree to, to which one is dedicated to something can make them be like, oh, this is like religiously important. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you don't encounter any mention of God in Scientology. There's no Jesus. There's no um, there's an acknowledgement that the idea in a supreme being is an important component in many people's lives, but um, you don't really ever get into it. Mm -hmm. What was it about your experience that, that enabled you to put aside this concern about religion? Do you know what I mean? Uh, well, actually, uh, it was that what you just said is that there is a acknowledgement in the eighth dynamic whenever I learned about dynamics, you know, uh, the eighth dynamic being the supreme being or God, whatever it is you believe, whether you're a Muslim or a Catholic or a Jew or whatever, uh, it's acknowledged that that, you know, is a part of people's lives and it's a part of some people's lives and it's a part of, sometimes it's not part of someone's life. So the explanation of the dynamics made complete sense to me your first dynamic yourself your second dynamic your family your friends your third dynamic the group fourth dynamic mankind fifth dynamic what's fifth dynamic plants and animals plants and animals sixth dynamic mess seventh dynamic you as a being uh i actually connected to that i did i do and still do have that sort of like spiritual kind of uh feeling about life because and, and I, the reason why uh, I don't really talk about it much as, as there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to give people the wrong impression. To me, before Scientology, music was my religion. That was, uh, you know, um, how I felt and it's still how I feel. So there was a, there was a really great pianist named Mur uh, Murray Scott Peraria, who is uh, one of the best uh, interpreters of, of almost all classical music on the piano. And, and he said in referring to Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, who is, if you've ever studied music seriously, you always end at Bach. And it's just, when you get to Bach, you're just like, Jesus Christ, how am I supposed to play this? You know, because he was so prolific and it, and it was, the music is so difficult. And in talking about Bach, Murray Scott Peraria in an interview, uh, on a, on a public television show in Italy said that he said this, and I'm paraphrasing to understand Bach, uh, you truly cannot be an atheist. You cannot not believe in God, in a God, uh, because the music that he wrote, um, is godlike and, and perfect in so many ways. And he said that whenever he realized that he was able to play Bach, in a way that, and, and, and he became famous for playing Bach, like all, all of the world over. Um, and that really hit me like a ton of bricks when I heard him say that, because this was uh, the piano player that I told you we played with in Hattiesburg. Uh, I, I asked him one time um, a couple of things. I said, you know, if I ever want to learn to play, play the piano, what would you advise me to do? And he said, well, number one, listen to anything Dr. John. Just listen to Dr. John all the time. Uh, so I was like, okay. And then when we left, he gave me a CD of Murray Scott Peraria. And I listened to that. And uh, that's what later, years later, led me down to researching Murray Scott Peraria. And uh, his, his, uh, his statement about uh, Bach, because I hate Bach. I just hate it. I can't play it. It's too hard. It's too damn hard. And you can ask any pianist or any cellist or anybody who's studied music seriously that if they've gotten their degree in music, the hardest part of it is playing those damn recitals with Bach. Like he's just like the devil, but he's God because it's like the music is perfect and it's very fast and it's very hard and it's just like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the eighth dynamic um that's what made it okay for me to uh be around that because it was like i don't have to believe you know i don't have to believe that it's a religion i can just believe that i'm a being you know which i already did so right right really interesting 
<clears throat> so how long, um, if we, I, I want to kind of fast forward to whatever the beginning of the end was for you. Mm. Like, okay. um, whenever, and also, you know, there's, there's usually never one moment when someone leaves Scientology, there's usually layers. Like yeah. sometimes someone will leave the Sea Org and then, and then they don't leave Scientology till like 10 years later, like in, in my situation. Um, yeah. And, and so for you, I don't know how it unraveled for you, whether it was your involvement at the mission or whatever, but what was kind of the beginning of the end for your involvement in what you were doing there at that time? Okay, the beginning of the end was whenever uh, my brother and his, uh, and his girlfriend at the time, Blue Staff, and uh, it was, I, was, I got very depressed and uh, and I was, and my stats were low, and I was in ethics back and forth from Ventura to Melrose, and I was still being used to to channel these celebrity people in, like Sybil Shepherd's daughter and Marcus Coloma, and um, James Vanderbeek, and like what? Were, well, James? Well, <laughs> yeah, how? <laughs> that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I remember I got PTSD. I'm like. <laughs> <clears throat> James dabbled in Scientology. I call him James. We're on, we're on first name basis. Okay, sweet. So James, yeah, Jimmy. I call him Jimmy. So <laughs> JJ. I, <laughs> um, throwing baseballs and shit. Um, no, uh, it, it, <coughs> because you know he was in a he was in a series with Katie Holmes, uh, and she ended up marrying Tom Cruise. But oh, I, she did. I hadn't heard about that. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, that did happen. Um, it was a real bad thing, but it turned out okay for her um thank god and so anyways don't, don't, how, don't let me do i won't derail your conversation no no, no it's fine i love it i love it i love it uh, <laughs> uh, i needed to get some bpc off there so uh, some, some little bypass charge um so hal uh ozan which was rachel minor's boyfriend uh worked with james on a couple of sets and knew him uh and he was one of the uh the hal and i were, were like uh no one could talk to hal like i could i was the fsmic and i was sort of like you know the guy that everyone liked to talk to i was the anti-scientologist scientologist because i didn't believe you know I, it, it, I gave the impression to most of the the public that there was stuff in here you could use but you know who cares if it's a religion or not if it helps you right because I don't believe it, you know. I don't. I don't. I don't subscribe to you know religions. So, um, so that was an attractive aspect, and I was able to communicate that very well with a lot of the public. So, real quick, FSMIC for the listeners is mm -hmm. um, the person who is in charge of getting public Scientologists to introduce new people to Scientology. So you were able to do that by almost being the. Yeah, don't worry about the religion shit. We're just here, tools to help you with life. Yep. <clears throat> yeah and uh, so uh hal hal was uh working on james uh and i was working with hal to get him like i was giving hal tools from like you know like i was teaching hal htci which is a uh, one of these tools that i was you know i was talking about manipulate manipulative tools the dei scale dei expanded and so HCCI uh, is it help communication control, control interest. interest and then DEI scale is uh, desire enforcement and uh, was it inhibit. desire yeah inhibit inhibition and um, so but he was doing it all wrong you know he hadn't, he hadn't really been trained to do that and he hadn't been drilled continuously to do it because it's one thing if you're a public and someone teaches you something uh, from a reference but it's another thing if you're on staff and you have to drill a reference drill a reference you were in qual so you probably know better than i do so um i was working with hal to do those kinds of processes with uh, with with james and uh it was one night he called me around uh 11 30 12 and he was like he's ready to come in he's ready to come in and um i i was like okay um so i went and i talked to the ed and i was like hey uh how's gonna bring james in tonight and uh i need monica over here to do the the ruin cycle and 
So the ruin, the ruin cycle is the interview where you basically try to get someone to spit out to you what is the one thing that they feel is ruining their life, and then you say Scientology can help you with that and just do a little course. That's right. All right. <laughs> so the uh, uh, the thing was is uh, Monica was in in big big time ethics trouble, and she was not. And we didn't have another PES, and and Hal was pretty insistent that it was Monica that do the cycle. So I had to basically say, "Sorry, we can't do it now." And he was like so pissed off at me, like it was a big time R A R C break. It was a big time A R C break between me and Hal. A R C break just means an upset. Yeah, and uh, so Hal is trying to bring in James Vanderbeek, and you guys are like. Sorry, bro, we're not set up right now. That's right, yeah. And and it was a huge, huge ARC break because at the time, James Vanderbeek had done Friday Night Lights. You know, he was like big. He was he was doing okay. You know, he wasn't a superstar, but uh, he was doing pretty damn good. And that would have been a, a great person for uh, the for that mission to, you know, legitimize uh, Scientology Melrose. And... Um, so that didn't work out and uh there was a huge arc break between me and him and his girlfriend and then that sort of rippled into all the rest of the networks that i was part of you know so uh there i was in the mission uh my whole field you know as i've become a field staff member i see my whole field is basically arc broken at that point which is like Boom! You know, like uh, failure. <laughs> so, um, and, and of course, I'm cause over that. So, you know, it's not Monica's fault for being in ethics. It's my fault for the timing being wrong. And I should have got him in the first time, right? You know, I should have got him in the second time. The third time, when I when we were gonna get him in, Monica was in trouble, so we couldn't do it. And uh, I started getting these hallucinations again, like the hallucinations came back. Oh shit. Yeah. And uh, I was in the hallway coming up the stairs and Monica was, uh, we were both in bad ethics trouble and I'd lost the whole field basically. And I had a major freak out, man. Like I was in the hall and I went into the corner. I know this sounds crazy, but I went into a corner like over here and I just had my head in the corner and I was just, shaking like this and monica comes up and she's she's like she 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 used what they call 8c in scientology where they just grab you and move you somewhere else control over the body and um uh, so she 8 seed me into a position and and she she was like trying to communicate with me and she was like marcus are you okay you know like do, do i need to bring you to a hospital or something and i'm like I'm like I, I i don't know like i was just having a total schizo moment and uh um i was not okay and she went to um to go tell john the hco and then when she when she walked away is when i went into the bookstore room and i went into the bookstore room and i'd been living in the mission after travis left they let me live in an auditing room and i was just sleeping on the floor um and and, and the, the bookstore was right next door to the where i was sleeping i walked into the bookstore room there was some rope that we had uh in the closet and with a bunch of tools and there was like uh, stacks of books and lectures and i opened up one of the ceiling tiles move it across because me and john had done all the construction there i knew there was a huge pipe there like a four inch pipe that wasn't going to move if i tied something onto it and uh aaron i swear to god dude at this point i i wasn't in my right frame of mind i just wanted it all to end i just wanted it, the, the hallucinations to end i wanted all of it to just be over with and i i tied that rope around the uh the pipe and uh i made a a noose with like five or six rungs and put it around my neck and uh climbed up onto some boxes that had lectures on them and um 
my mom always said that I had angels watching out for me. Um, as soon as I as soon as I step off, I'm gonna step off this thing, and I feel the noose, and, and it I'm hanging. Uh, and John walks in, and he just his eyes get super big, and he's like, "What the fuck?" And he jumps up onto the boxes, and he's a big guy. He's very muscular. I guess he's done construction his whole life. Very, very good in shape. And he and he grabs me around my waist, and he lifts me up. And then he's standing on these boxes, and he's looking up at me, and he gets the rope. He pulls the rope off, and he gets it off of my head. And he's screaming at me, and I, I'm kind of like kind of halfway out of it. I wasn't hanging very long. But he grabs my arm and he's jerking me through the uh, HGC, which is where the, all the auditing happens. There's a long hallway in the back of the Melrose Mission. He's physically abusing me. He's throwing me up against the wall, calling me a fucking degraded being. And, and uh, he's like, this is, this is fucking it for you, man. You're, you're fucking done. You could say goodbye to Scientology. And um, he brings me to the ED's office which was Chris Baumgartner and he sits me down in the chair and I'm just kind of like, I'm just kind of like just dead, numb, emotionally numb. And, and he, Tom, uh, uh, let's see, John tells Chris, he's like, I found this fucking DB in the bookstore room trying to drop the body. Oh my God, dude. And Chris, the ED, looks at me very, very. I mean, Chris is like just sitting there, <clears throat> and he looks at he looks at me, and he's like, "Hmm, that figures." And he picks up the phone, calls Kathy, and he says, "Hey, Kathy, this. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you who it is, but uh, uh, someone just tried to drop the body over here. So, uh, what do you want me to do? Something like that, along those lines." And Kathy. Uh, he, then, then he put the phone down and put it on speaker, and Kathy said, oh, well, I, yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. I guess I'll be coming in a day early. I'll get my plane ticket changed over. So uh, Kathy came back a day early. It was the next day. Um, she was scheduled to come back that week, and uh, she showed up the mission, and she had a bunch of paperwork for me to sign. And we sat out on the balcony of melrose smoking cigarettes um and she was like i'm sorry that i failed you um you can be discharged you can be honorably discharged you're not going to have an fld like travis there were some things that i was wrong oh, about FLD, that, you mean a freeloader debt right um because i mean at that point i'd been regged a lot uh and they got me for close to Close to thirty-eight thousand or something like that for services, uh, auditing services, and um, none of which I'd received. I'd received a hell of a lot of sec checking, <clears throat> but uh, basically she had this big stack of papers, and I signed off on all this stuff, and it was probably like saying I'll never try to sue them or I'll never try to libel or slander them and shit like that, and. Um, she was like, you know, what I'd like to see you do is to route out properly. And, uh, you know, even though you even though I'm giving you a free pass and you're not on staff, you're not required to do staff anymore. You don't have to be you have to work these crazy hours. You clearly can't handle it. You know, it was, it, on, on one hand, she was being very compassionate. But on the other hand, she was kind of like being very like uh, condescending, you know, like, sorry, you can't handle this, you know and uh but i was so happy just i was just like i'm done you know like i could get out you know like I, this is over um and it, the hallucinations like weren't as bad as suddenly suddenly i don't know why uh and i was very happy that i could go out and maybe try and get a job and uh the rest of the the, the rest of the story is just a year long of sec checking i got a job working at an internet cafe um there's a lot of overts and withholds on the meter about masturbation and all this crap and uh they have a lot of things that i've written down that are from you know uh present time and past life overts and uh at a certain point towards the very end 
my auditor was like, basically, no, not basically, like she was literally telling me what to write. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's stuff that I have written down because I worked at an internet cafe. There was, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's LA, there's all kind of freaky weird shit. You know, like I saw, you know, the first video of the, the guy getting his head cut off by the ISIS people or whatever. Um, but there's also child pornography that we had to clean off of the computers, you know, and this was like not just not just like someone making a child pornography. This was like wholesale, like fully organized Pizzagate type child porn. Mm. And uh, so like what my auditor wanted me to do was to write, you know, because of course I'm a, I'm a male. I'm not having sex. I didn't have sex really at all on staff. So, you know, I, ma I masturbate. So. Uh, she wanted me to put two and two together, you know, like, oh, well, you saw this child porn on a computer and you masturbate. So I need you to write that. Oh, dude. So there is, there's OWs, there is OWs <clears throat> in my own handwriting saying that I masturbate to child porn. Is at that point, I'm ready, I'm done. Like, I was done a year ago. This sex check lasted a year. So like, I'm like, I'm doing five to six hours a day. It's interfering with my job. Uh, my boss was being very cool about it. Um, but at a certain point, yeah, after a year, it was like, you know, I ended up having quit that job and go work at a coffee shop because it was interfering so much with my job. And uh, once I finally finished my, once my needle floated and all that, um, I was free to go. Wow. Um, at that time that you were leaving, um, well, that you were being told you were going to leave and were leaving the mission, were you still planning on staying in Scientology? Yeah. That's why you signed all the papers. Right. Because normally when you leave staff, there's no fucking paperwork. Right. There's nothing for you to sign. Your obligation is up. Um, and that's the other thing that, I, I mean, I think some people have already gotten this idea from previous stories. You will sign anything. Um, I'll tell from my own perspective, when I was leaving the Sea Org, mm -hmm. um, very similar to what you were just describing, where on the one hand, they're being friendly and nice. And on the other hand, they're asking, they're saying things and asking you to sign things that are incredibly insulting. Right? Right. Right. Like me and my wife left the Sea Org because we were having a baby. And yet all the paperwork says you are acknowledging that the reason you're leaving the Sea Org is you are unable to maintain the high ethical standards of the Sea Org. You're like, yeah. now the way I uh, justified signing all these papers is that I knew this wasn't a secret. I knew very well that the only reason this paperwork even existed was to protect the church against future attacks. And I go, I don't care what you're asking me to sign because I only know I'm, it's only to protect you from me attacking you in the future. Right. But I'm right. never going to attack you in the future. So I don't care that I have to sign all this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. That was my same, that was, the, that was my same logical and reason behind, uh, logic and reason behind writing up this hor horrendous, heinous fucking crime shit. You know, like I'll sign, I'll write whatever the fuck you want because I'm still going to be a Scientologist. You know, you'll never, and I kind of got the idea that the point was, is that, you know, you know, if you ever, uh, if you ever cross us, you know that th this is a this is a reality. You know, there is there is a sub. I don't want to say subconscious, but there is a undertone and a sort of like uh, if you ever if you ever you you sign this and you know that, and this is why we're having you sign it, even though it's like you know not really spoken that way. It's not communicated that way. Um, yeah, absolutely. What a shame. I mean, uh, huh. and you know, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I've been really wanting to do a video about the lower conditions isn't that I really care whether people understand the lower conditions or not, but because the the videos that the church puts together um, in response to the people that appear on Leah Remini's show oftentimes include statements that they have made, right? That are so over the top, and I'll use their. I'm not going to get this word for word, but. They, they have put up images of statements in Mike Rinder's own handwriting right. that say things to the effect of, I have never 
produced anything of value in my career. And in fact, all of the results of my production are destruction. And everything I do results in overwork and inconvenience for David Miscavige. And you go, <laughs> any rational person would see these things and go, who the fuck says something like that about themselves? <laughs> like the, something is not computing here. People don't say things like that about themselves. But I want people to understand that those are the kind of things people end up writing down and committing to paper right. when they're doing the lower ethics conditions. Yeah. Because they have to write down something that will appease the person who assigned them the condition. That's and right. in this case, it's David Miscavige. So if David Miscavige says to Mike Rinder, you're in a condition of treason. Well, Mike Rinder has to sit down at a table with a pen and a paper and do the formula for treason and enemy. And as a part of doing this, and actually even for doubt, you mentioned the doubt formula. Well, it says... Um, you know, basically describe and examine the activities and intentions of the group that one has been pretending to be a part of despite personal danger right. um, <clears throat> or despite personal gain or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have to sit there and go, okay, well, what's the group that I've been being a part of? Mm -hmm. but you don't sit down and say, I've been being a part of the Church of Scientology. You're like, no, that's oh. the group you've been pretending to be a part of. What's right. the real group you've been being a part of? Just I've been uh, being a blessing. part of the group that commits destructive acts on a daily basis. Yeah. Make David Miscavige's life hard. And Great I've been being a part of the group that has hidden evil purposes and destructive intentions, intentions against right. L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. Like, you mm -hmm. mind fuck yourself yep. and then you write it down yep. to make someone else happy. Mm -hmm. And then at, at some point, you do start to believe that shit. I mean, you write it down enough yeah. times in enough detail. Oh, yeah. And it all starts to make sense in the, some weird way in your head. And I want people to understand that when they see these statements that the church trots out, where mm -hmm. someone is just eviscerating themselves, mm -hmm. that's because they're doing these lower ethics conditions. And it is what is required of you in order to finish the condition. I want people to know that. People, by and large, this your casual Scientology watcher does not know enough about Scientology to understand that that's what happened. There's a phenomenon called the illusory truth effect that is uh, very much related to that. And uh, the illusory truth effect is essentially, it's related to belief perseverance. But um, since it's not true, it's illusory, you know, illusion, not true. Um, you're, writing, you're writing this OW down, you're writing this over it out. Um, it's, an illus it's an illusory truth, but then you get confirmation from someone else oh yes you were part of that group thank you for doing that now you're out of treason right so that is comfort that that gives you confirmation and then the process can repeat the process can you know be over but by and large <clears throat> as you come up through the lower conditions and especially once you get to liability everything that you've done up to that point gets agreement from everybody that you have to sign that liability. Because when you do a liability, everyone that, you're, that you've that you committed this sin against has to sign off on it. Well, they, they haven't necessarily read your overts and withholds, but they're signing off on the liability, which gives group, uh, well, essentially this uh, belief perseverance. And, and it strengthens this illusory truth effect, which, explains the phenomenon you're talking about where you start to believe it it's a yeah. horrible horrible thing so when this happens <clears throat> and, and i hope everyone who's watching this video is really struck by the complete lack of care for the individual on behalf of anybody involved in at that time in that situation it's not oh my god let's get him help it's not oh my god what could have driven someone to something like this it's not Let's, in anything, it's like, look at this motherfucker piece of shit, you know, trying to ruin our day, trying mm -hmm. to upset people, trying to get attention. Such a selfish, degraded, bad in person. Yeah. That is how Scientology views people who struggle. Yep. Like, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and stop being such a victim. There's no real care. You know, it's, it's, um, oh, I felt incredibly guilty and horrible for having thought 
for a second of, of hanging myself in the Melrose mission, I felt horrible. I was like, what could I have done? Uh, this would have been so horrible for Scientology. I'd suffer for a million trillion, 76 trillion years trying to make up for the damage that I've done. You know, I really felt that way for a long time, even even after I left, even after I moved home. You know, I was like, man, I really fucked up. Um, but then, you know, over time, I'm like, you know, I didn't really fuck up. When I started to tell, tell people what happened, nobody knew that's what happened. My brother didn't know. Uh, all Kathy told him was that something had happened with Marcus. That's all the information he knew. And he didn't know until I told him just, you know, maybe four or five years ago. And uh, some of the other people I'd contacted uh, that we had done cycles with that were incredibly destructive in their life, like Alex Merrick's, uh, you know, incredible baseball player, just completely sucked everything out of him and his family within a couple of years. And, uh, you know, it contributed a lot to his, his, uh, his career not really taken off the way it should have and they were shocked you know um they were completely shocked they couldn't believe and i and i've heard people say that leah said she doesn't she didn't know the extent of some of the abuses that were going on in front of her around her and, and working around celebrities i know for a fact that they don't like uh they don't have any some of them really have no idea the C word and the staff are treated the way that they are. They think that they're like uh, supermen, you know? <laughs> um, they admire staff. Like, I mean, I've had celebrities quote, flow me admiration just for being on staff, you know? Uh, my brother was able to meet Tom Cruise at one of his premieres and, and he told him that he was a staff member and Tom flowed him all this admiration, you know, like made a point to, to shake his hand more effusively than someone else, you know, uh, for longer. And uh, that uh, the, 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 there are term, there are people, I was about to say particles, there are, because <laughs> everything's a damn particle, Scientology. Everything's yeah, a particle or a cycle. <laughs> where's that damn ethics particle? Bring it in here, let's reg him for another 10 grand. Uh, get him to sell his house. Does he have his grandma? Didn't he inherit some of his grandmother's stuff? That maybe she had some old silver certificates. Let's get those in. Let's get him on training for. Uh, let's send him to flag for uh, class five training. That's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna do today. Uh, um, yeah, that uh, they live in a bubble. There, there's a bubble, and it's not necessarily that they live in it, but it's created around them. You know, by the staff. I mean. God, God forbid and God damn you for allowing a celebrity or any opinion leader to see you in pain or struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. So you had that, um, that point where things sort of explode and then they let you go, make you go. Mm -hmm. um, what happens between that point and then whenever you... Uh, I was going to say whenever you left Scientology, but I, I, one thing I do want people to understand is that there's usually never a, this is the moment when I left Scientology. It's some sort of a process. But yeah. But what essentially occurred between that point at the mission and the point where you at least start to go, okay, I'm not a Scientologist anymore? Um, a lot. I mean, there was a lot of uh, like what they call recovery cycles where uh, Sea Org terminals would contact me. And because I was in HQS, I completed the Hubbard Qualified Scientologist course, which made me a member of the Hubbard Association of Scientologists International. Um, and anytime someone completes that course, your name goes into a special folder. And um, so they were trying to, you know, recover me and recruit me for different things. I've had people try to rec uh, recruit me for FLAG or recruit me for Narconon or uh, the uh, Way to Happiness or the Applied Scholastics. Just a never-ending series. But what, what ended up happening uh, that started the, the snowball rolling was uh, when I left, I was given a uh, program by the Director of Special Affairs at CCM. And that program was to read, uh, or sorry, yeah, to read every book and write an extensive 
report uh, explaining my full conceptual understanding of the book and also to do the same with all of the lectures that had been released up into that point, which I owned. So and that's a lot of freaking lectures and a lot of books. And so my my uh, um, origination to these people who are trying to recover me was that, look, I've got a bunk ass CS case supervisor uh, or program that I'm supposed to do. And I would explain to them that the, the DSA at CCN told me to do this. And they're like, well, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound like any program that I've heard of. And so they try to get to the bottom of it. And I'm saying, and then I started saying, oh, while you're at it, why don't you try to find out where all my money went? Because I didn't get any of the auditing that I was told I was going to get. Uh, I'm paid up to my drug rundown. And uh, they're like, yeah, yeah. Some there were some terminals, uh, some C org people that uh, were very motivated to figure this out. It was a mystery for them, and it probably gave them a reason to because um, they were probably in lowers doing recovery cycles and it gave them uh, a reason to like dig around make phone calls and kill time you know so that they're not being there's not fire being you know breathed down their neck all day and uh, so there was there was several years of that uh, people recovering people trying to recover me um, and then uh, Dominic the guy that got me in the guy that stood in front of the door there were a couple of uh, years of uh, communication with him. His wife actually married me and my wife. Uh, we had a Scientology wedding uh, in 2009. And uh, there was, uh, I started to talk to other people, like I was saying, like Alex and stuff, and, and apologize for, for the financial ruin that I contributed to their lives and all that stuff. And and then as I started to all talking to them, you know, because this is all taboo stuff you're not supposed to talk about, you know, like uh, I'm supposed to just keep my mouth shut and not say anything. Um, well, it started to sort of break that taboo and um, communication became slowly over time. The communication that I would have with people like Alex, people uh, like the PES at Ventura, who I, I would say his name, but I don't know if he's okay with that yet. Um, my brother, um, Alex's little sister, um, who worked for Christy Alley for a little while. Um, you know, these people, like, they were initially, they didn't talk to me about that kind of stuff, and they didn't know that I had tried to commit suicide in the mission. So when I told them that, and then I told them I'm sorry for all the bullshit and whatever. Um, then they, they started with their tiny little snowball and then, you know, starts going down and, and they start reading the materials they're not supposed to read. And so, um, that's what started, what started it really was, um, reading the, uh, reading the OT materials, um, and experiencing a lot of, uh, like, <laughs> online uh when i was uh, i played online games and uh one of the rules in the guild that i was in that i created was uh no really no religious bigotry <laughs> and the big reason why was because i didn't want any shit for being a scientologist because i was openly a scientologist and uh when people would find out that their guild leader was a scientologist they were like they were like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And then I'd be like, guild kick, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kick them out of the guild. I don't want to deal with it. Um, but over time, yeah, it just became, it's like, I was like, you know what? Maybe these people are onto something. And I had a friend who was uh, who, who very, very intelligent individual, months away from his PhD. His mother took sick and he started taking care of her. And then his, and then his dad got sick, but he's a philosophy and religious studies major and uh or he was about to have his phd and he uh slowly over the course of several years helped me in ways that i can't even really describe but it got me to a point to where i was not afraid to read the materials and i started reading the materials and once i started dude it was just like a flood it was like and 
it was intense. It was overwhelming. Um, it was all encompassing for days, weeks, months. I would read stuff. Uh, I contacted a class 12 auditor and started asking him because he blew. You know, I was like, why the fuck did a class, if you're a class 12 auditor, you don't blow. You know what I mean? So, um, Pierre Etier, I contacted him. Oh, yeah, 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 I know Pierre. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he helped me a lot. Um, as far as he helped me a lot in, in realizing that there's no information that I can read that's going to hurt me, you know, um, which was very beneficial to me because there was, I mean, there was a valid fear, you know, it was a really valid fear, uh, that just as, just as valid as a, a Christian thinks that if they sin, they're going to hell, you know, it's just like a fundamentalist Christian, you know, like, oh my God, if I do this, I'm going to go to hell. Um, same kind of feeling. So Pierre really helped me out in that regard. And uh, in 2013, I did a, a marketing campaign for a district attorney race. And during that time, uh, I was talking openly to some attorneys and stuff about Scientology. And uh, he's like, wow, sounds like they got a really good business model, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and I was like, that's what it is, man. I mean, that's all it is. So like, I, uh, I, um, something, some light bulb went off and I was like, I'm ready to talk about it. I'm ready to talk about it. And I made that two hour long excruciating video, um, during a time where me and my wife were not doing well and were separated. And, uh, it was very therapeutic for me. Uh, but unfortunately I had to stop making the videos because the divorce, like, um, it, you know, you don't, you don't want to be doing that kind of stuff when you're having, uh, a divorce going on, that's high conflict and you, you got children involved. So once, once all of that was taken care of, which took about two years, I was, uh, was okay again to start talking again. Um, and I had subscribers that were there from the beginning that, uh, that have been there since 2014 or 2015, whenever the first video was produced, uh, like that waited until I started making videos again, which was like two and a half years or something. So, uh, those, pe those people were all of those su subscribers really helped me out a lot because it gave me some validation my, my folks and stuff they didn't ever really understand what was going on they never knew either they never knew what was happening um they just saw their son on drugs and then their then their son's not on drugs yes he's in this weird organization but he's not on drugs you know uh my biological father different story he went before the internet was what it is now he actually found out what it was found out that it was a cult got some resources from Steve Hassan and was trying to actually intervene, do an intervention and get me and my brother out of it. Um, didn't know that at the time, but uh, found that out later. And uh, he died uh, in 2009 and I made my peace with him, you know, um, after he died. But the thing was, it was like he was the only person that really took the time to look into Scientology and say, what the fuck is my kid doing? Um, other than, you know, that was the only support that I had and he was dead. And the subscribers really were there for me emotionally, you know, whereas a lot of my friends and family, they just don't get it. You know, just like most people, they're just like, how could you be so this? How could you fall for that? So. That was uh, that was kind of how the ball started rolling, you know. It was it, it started as a where the fuck, where'd my money, you know, where'd my money go, and why am I assigned this crazy program where I have to read every single book and every lecture and write a report on it and submit it back to the DSA? That sounds like a shoot, get the hell out of here kind of a program, you know? Right, right, right. So, um. What I'd like to do moving, uh, in, you know, moving forward with these interviews is not have them just have to be like about a specific topic, but 
you know, kind of like what we've done here. I mean, well, actually, on this interview, we've pretty much stuck to a, a relatively chronological telling of your story. Yeah. But I wanted to do it. Um, <clears throat> I want to do it kind of like the way Joe Rogan does his interviews. Like he'll bring someone on who has something to promote. Like mm -hmm. in other words, they actually have a very specific reason for being there. Yeah. And they'll just talk for two or three hours about fucking anything. They won't even talk about the project. <laughs> hey, I'm cool. I'm cool with that. So like, uh, and, I, and I don't mean let's just talk about literally nothing. But, you know, just because we've done an interview here where we've pretty much told um, a, a significant portion of your story, uh, we should do something else in the future of like, Let's say you've just got some 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 aspect of the subject you want to discuss, and then we'll just discuss it and sure. go wherever it goes. It doesn't even have to be about something ultra specific. I like that. Um, yeah, I think people really do get a lot um, out of seeing um, former Scientologists talk about it, mm -hmm. as opposed to just a former Scientologist being interviewed by a non-Scientologist and asking very very basic basic basic. Yeah, uh, we've all seen that. Uh, we've all seen that enough at this point, right? I mean. Exactly. Yeah, going forward. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm down for whatever, Aaron. Um, I really appreciate the uh, uh, the message and everything. Um, I'm I'm not a, you know, I, I do videos. Okay, you know, when I feel it, when I'm feeling it, I do a video. And um, I had a I had a moment a little while back where I was like, should I keep doing videos because I feel like I'm part of the freak show. It's part of the problem, not the solution. But um, there's a um i have some i have some really unique resources at this point that i'm going to be utilizing to produce some content that will be uh basically taking someone through that journey that i experienced and um most of the people that were involved that are out of the well, actually all of the people that were involved in my journey in scientology that are now no longer scientologists are a hundred percent behind me in producing this and showing it that way, which is the way in which a person, and these are all really smart people too in their own right, you know? So like how they got, you know, how we all got into this crap and, um, and showing that because we, they all have families. A lot of them came from loving families. A lot of them have a lot of supportive people around them and, um, it will show people finally that's the that's the intention is that it will finally show people oh <clears throat> this can happen to literally anybody yeah well all right um <clears throat> for all those who have stuck through this whole video because right. there's almost nothing i'm getting there's almost nothing i'm gonna edit out of this thing oh shit. uh don't forget to check out um marcus's youtube channel it's called vlog world You've got some great videos on there really great videos and um, I think people will get a lot out of those. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Marcus, thanks for, thanks for talking to me. And uh, see you guys soon. Bye. Bye.